So the issue, as everybody should know on this call, on February 4th, um, Langan, on behalf of HHC, issued the draft remedial investigation report. And that is the document that pulls together all of the information that was generated in these five plus phases of field investigation. Um, we had spoken generally before the report was issued about the findings. Um, uh, so now we can get into more specifics. Um, the largest concern going into this, one of several, but the primary, a lot of the concern and focus was on mercury contamination that was suspected to be um, at the site based on the historic use of the site as a thermometer factory and related warehouse um, and uh, support buildings. So in, in the investigation, soil impacts related to mercury were identified in the footprint of the former thermometer factory primarily. Uh, the highest concentration, I believe, was around 750 parts per million of mercury total. Uh, lower concentrations were reported at distance away from block 302, which is where the footprint of the thermometer factory was, and lower concentrations down with depth, um, ultimately um, reaching the standard or non-detect in all but about three or four locations. So the report very um, clearly lays out where all the soil borings were conducted, the fact that DEC required uh, Lang and HHC to go back and do additional soil borings after the first phase of data were back in order to try to get a better understanding of the concentrations in thermometer factory footprint, block 302, or lot 302, sorry, um, and to try to better understand the distribution of concentrations across the site. So there were other areas where um, mercury was identified, the support building locations um, known as the factories or the, uh, the warehouse or the resident structures, lower but still above soil remediation standards. Um, the unrestricted use standard for mercury is 0 0.18 micrograms per kilogram or parts per million. Um, the residential uh, restricted use or re re residential use, I believe, is uh, 0.81 micrograms per kilogram. So delineation was to the most stringent standard, and it was achieved, you know, as I said, vertically uh, in all but three or four locations, primarily because the um, uh, they encountered what's called refusal, um, most often on timber structures, uh, in one case or more on rock, pieces of rock where they couldn't get past with the, the drill rig that they were using. Um, so those, those locations, though, I think will be addressed one of two ways. Either they will go out and do confirmation sampling uh, at, at a future date, either as part of the remediation, or they're going to be excavating soils in those locations um, down below the water table. And, and you wouldn't be doing soil sampling below the water table. Um, you stop your sampling when you get to that point. So the lateral delineation was achieved um, in, in these areas as well. Uh, again, any fine-tuned delineation that would need to be done could be done uh, at a later date, but the remediation from the review of the remedial investigation work plan is going to involve excavation of soil essentially across the entire site. So at this point, the data for the mercury impacts in soil are really most importantly used for management of that soil during excavation, determining what disposal options are going to be for that soil, um, and then obviously ensuring that the work practices that are being proposed for the excavation of that soil um, are safe, you know, with respect to uh, the workers on site and obviously to the community. And I know that a lot of the concern is going to be from the community related to what happens during the excavation of this impacted soil, during the offloading of it into trucks for offsite transportation to the disposal facilities, and you know what happens in terms of ambient air quality during those activities. Um, so those are all things that are discussed in the report in uh, terms of the human health risk exposure assessment. Um, but they will be getting into more detail with respect to the methods and procedures that they're proposing 
um, when they issue the draft remedial action work plan, which is the work plan that comes after um, this document. Um, and I'll get back to that in a second. Um, so the good news with the investigation in general is that they're the only impacts to groundwater that were identified related to site activities um, are in the vicinity of these these underground storage tanks, which was known that there were underground storage tanks from the phase two work that they had done. Uh, and they confirmed that these tanks have impacted soil and groundwater in the immediate vicinity of where the tanks are located. Um, and that soil in, those soil impacts and that groundwater impact will also be addressed as part of the remedial action um, that will be proposed and laid out in the remedial action work plan. So the balance of what was identified in soil, which includes various concentrations of metals um, other than mercury, including lead, and, and there are some exceedances of other different metals that are related to what's called the historic fill, which is fill that essentially was contaminated prior to being brought onto the site, or that is fill that was generated during various demolition activities on site and essentially is now exhibiting various concentrations of metals, um, as well as some what's called semi-volatile organics, which are things that are not volatile from and, and dangerous from an inhalation perspective, but they have in you know their own cleanup standards as well. And so those have been documented at the site. Those were known going into this RI because they were also identified in the phase two. Uh, and they've established that essentially historic fill exists at the site, you know, curb to curb across the entire property. And that's not unexpected because this whole region was developed and the site was raised above the water table because it was historically uh, at or under water, um, which a large portion of this you know, area obviously historically was. So the fill that was brought in to raise the grade above the water table or above the free standing water um, is of varying quality. Uh, and that is very common uh, in areas that are waterfront that were redeveloped because there were no regulations to restrict, you know, what could be brought onto a site back in that time frame. So it's common to see various types of metals and the semi-volatile organics in the soil. Um, but again, the redevelopment um, integrated into remedial action is the outcome of this process right now is that the next step is going to be integrating what has to be done for site redevelopment into remedial action so that the remedial action will actually be more extensive, perhaps, than it might otherwise be because the proposed redevelopment is, is include, includes a a uh, building slab that will be below the water table. So they have to remove the soils above the water table and then and then some. And in certain places, they have to go even deeper because um, of the way the building is designed, the build, building features. Um, they're going to be going below the water table and therefore the vast majority of the historic fill um, by virtue of the need to open up and, and make room for the subgrade portion of the building um, will, will be removed and then managed properly off site. So that will include these hot spots, which have to be removed for the remedy, you know, the mercury impacted soil and the underground storage tanks and the associated petroleum impacts and whatever localized hot spots have to be removed. But there will also be removal of a large portion of the historic fill that would otherwise be able to remain behind if it wasn't for the need to remove it for purposes of development. They will also need to be lowering the water table um, in order to do that work. And that will also remove groundwater. And in the case of the underground storage tank impacted areas, the remedial action work plan will focus in on removal of those underground storage tanks, removal of the impacted soil, addressing the impacted groundwater, which is localized in those areas, does not spread across the entire site. It's localized in the vicinity of where these underground storage tanks are, which is generally on the um, uh, PEC slip 
uh, and going up towards Pearl Street. So down at the intersection of Peck Slip and Water Street, there are underground storage tanks, and there are also historic um, uh, oil impacts going up towards uh, Pearl Street on the Peck Slip side. So all of that material will be addressed as part of the remedial action work plan. Um, but lowering the water table will also help them address the groundwater. And, and it's not clear right now what's going to be proposed for treating groundwater in those areas, but that will be developed as part of the remedial action work plan. It will go into more detail as to what would be envisioned there to address that. Um, so as far as the overall assessment of our of the of the data, um, that's kind of a broad overview of the findings in, in a nutshell. There are some specifics uh, like isolated impacts related to PCBs that will also be addressed um, through excavation, most likely. Um, the lead that was reported in the historic fill will likely also go most of it, if not all of it. Again, it depends upon the extent of the historic fill removal because those impacts were associated with the historic fill. Um, so as far as the assessment um, of the mercury, one of the important findings was um, the they did what's called sequential extraction for identifying the type of mercury that was being reported in the soil. Because as we talked about when we were developing the remedial action work plan comments, um, the mercury that was of, mo of most concern to the community was the elemental mercury, which can, can be uh, volatile at room temperature. Um, what the data resulted in was in anywhere between 6% and 11% of the reported mercury in soil uh, fell into the category of elemental mercury. So it was a relatively small percentage. So not all of the mercury reported in the soil samples that I just mentioned uh, was in fact in an elemental mercury form. So that would explain why when during, will help explain, while during the RI implementation, there were not any exceedances in the ambient air during the monitoring for the on-site um, air quality monitoring, as well as the perimeter uh, camp monitoring or the off-site. They did detect some vapors through screening with the drone meter, the individual soil samples and the cores that came up when they were very right up close to the cores themselves, there were some detections, but they were not extraordinarily high. They were moderate levels, low to moderate, and they were not ambient air low concentrations. So one of the things that we're going to be talking about uh, when we, Tom Facillo, the other community consultant and I, when we speak to DEC about our thoughts on this report is, again, this ability to correlate what they found during the RI with how, what they can expect to see when they do soil excavation. Um, and they do uh, address and they provided, you know, a, an elemental mercury exposure assessment um, that is highly technical. We, we really can't get into the details of that tonight unless anybody has a specific question, but we can and will be providing comments um, that the uh, community can review, um, you know, prior to our having a detailed discussion with uh, DEC. So the written comments that we have on the RI report will be developed after um, I have a little bit more time to listen to any of the community's concerns uh, and make sure that you know I'm hearing what the community is concerned about with respect to the data, with respect to the report, with respect to what was reported and found and what the conclusions were. And then that basically is the end of our, our currently authorized work scope. Um, after we've relayed those comments to DEC and had a discussion with DEC um, regarding the draft RI work plan, uh, the draft RI report, I'm sorry. Um, so in general, I thought that the RI, as it progressed, um, was done very well. It was done in accordance with the work scope, the work plan. Um, the good news is we did not have any ambient air quality issues with respect to mercury or with respect to dust. For the most part, there was only 1 or 2 minor incidents that were 
work related in the field that were immediately addressed with respect to dust. But in general, um, the mercury vapor concentrations, um, you know, were, were not an, an issue. Um, but then again, we have to take a closer look at what we could expect when the excavation work uh, pro proceeds. And, you know, there needs to be, and it is addressed in this report, that there will be a construction health and safety plan. There will be community air monitoring plan. The remedial action work plan will address you know, the means and methods for how the soil will be excavated, how it will be handled, um, how dust and vapor, volatile organic or, or mercury vapor concentrations will be managed and mitigated, uh, the best management practices that will go into that. Um, they discuss that these are going to be components of the remedial action work plan um, that will be the next document that would be submitted to the agencies. Um, that document has a 45 day public review period built into the Brownfields cleanup program timeline. Uh, and as part of the citizen participation plan, um, the community will have an opportunity to, to hear from the DEC. Um, there'll be a public meeting uh, that will likely be virtual, um, but there'll be an opportunity for the public to provide comments for the community to provide comments in addition to the, um, if, if if you have the the community consultant still on board, in addition to our being able to provide comments on your behalf. So I'll let anybody have any questions. I know there's a lot of information. Um, it's very highly technical, but there are some very good figures in it that um, provide you know a, a visual representation of the soil borings that were conducted and the mercury concentrations that were reported. It shows where the elevated concentrations are. It shows where they are with depth. Um, and it shows where the water table was encountered. And then it talks about the fact that the redevelopment will require soil removal um, to depths of you know, upwards of 20 feet, maybe even more in some areas. And it will vary depending upon where you are at the site. But for the most part, it looks like the excavation will go down to well below the historic fill in some places, down to the top of the water table uh, in most places, and possibly even below the water table um, in the central section of the site, where you know the area where the mercury was impact uh, impacts were identified uh, is located. So there'll be a very large amount of removal of this material before the redevelopment would even begin. Okay, Laura, that's. Oh, terrific, and thank you so much. Um, really helpful, I hope, to everyone here. I know there were a lot of concerned folk who have probably some questions for you. I'll just start yep. as we do with the committee members. Do we have any questions there? I don't see any at first. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, I think it's Paul. Paul Goldstein? Yeah, sorry. Here, Paul. Uh Good evening, everyone. Hi, Paul. Paul, forgive me for interrupting, but I would ask, unless there's a reason not to, to just appear, if you can bless us with your, your face. Those of you who are asking questions, it's always welcome. If not, no problem. All right, I think I could manage that. Let me put it on. But in the meantime, let me ask a couple of questions while, sure. that's, while that's getting done. Um, so one just general fundamental question I have is, yes. did you find anything in this report surprising or worrisome? Um, not surprising um, with respect to the data that we had seen prior to the report being drafted. Um, there were one or two suites of um, parameters that I don't believe we had. I had seen the data for before the report was issued, um, but they're not. Again, they're not related to the operations at the site. They seem to be something related to either the fill or coming onto the site, actually from the region around. So I want to have a little discussion with the DC about those um, because I don't believe that we saw those data before um, the report was issued, and we were involved in every step of the way. To the performance of the work. So that, that was something that I didn't expect, but not worrisome. Um, 
As far as the rest of the work is concerned, um, actually, I thought it was well done and pulled together comprehensively. Um, one of the things that I really focused on in our discussions with DEC was to hope and relay to Langan and HHC to draft the report in a manner that would be more user friendly for the public. And I thought that they did a good job in keeping it very data centric, like having the tables in the text, having a lot of figures to relay what was done. And it, it's a lot of very technical information. So it's hard to really get that visual across. Um, but I thought that that would have done well. Um, my concern, I think, is going to be the same concern that a lot in the community have, which is there needs to be, you know, a lot of care taken with the performance of the next phase of work, you know, in terms of the removal of soils that are impacted at the site and removal of underground storage tanks, managing of the groundwater. That the focus now needs to be on ensuring that there's going to be safe work practices um, and that the monitoring of air quality dust, making sure no soil and dust is transported off site during the performance of the work. Um, that's really now the focus, I think, uh, based upon knowing what was found and knowing what has to be done uh, to achieve the remedial action goals. Okay, let me just ask one or two more quick questions. One sure. is, it sounds like uh, the amount of work, at least to me, sounds more than I sort of anticipated. You know, it sounds like everything needs to be removed, water needs to be pulled out, et cetera, et cetera. So how long will a job like this take? Um, it's really difficult for me to say exactly what the length of time will be for this work to be performed, but the remedial action work plan is uh, being developed right now and should be submitted to the agencies within the next several weeks. And in that report, there'll be a schedule and the schedule will not necessarily have a start date on a calendar because that's not typically what goes in with the remedial action work plan. It'll have a series of uh, tasks and durations related to those tasks. So we'll be able to see what their estimated time frame is because it really depends on a number of things in terms of how long something like this would take. It depends on how many pieces of equipment they have operating at one time. It's a small site, so there's gonna be logistical challenges in terms of operating equipment. Safely also is, you know, cause it's a very important aspect of this work that they have room to work within in a manner that's safe. They have to load trucks. They have to have room to do that. So to the extent that they have one crew working versus two crew work, crews working versus three crews working, you know, you can do, do things faster if you have multiple crews operating at, a, at the same time. Okay. You might not be able to do that because of the physical constraints here. And so, we'll get more of that picture with the next report, you're saying. Uh, yes, exactly. And I, I don't want to presuppose because, again, it, it really is a construction management question as to how they want to design and, and proceed with that work. And just one more thing, you said yes. they have to re also remove, in addition to soil and things, water. So will that have to be pumped out and put in vehicles? And I mean, obviously, <laughs> that. Mm -hmm. and, and all right. So no, that's, how, that's what they do. They just pump it out. Right. There'll be dewatering that will be required for two reasons. One, to address the underground storage tank uh, removal. I don't know if they're actually they're talking about treating the groundwater in place. So the dewatering is largely to be able to access the soil they have to excavate and also to get to their finished elevation to put in the slab for the building. Um, that from reading the report, that slab will be below the water table for the most part. So the dewatering would come in in, in order to enable them to do that. Um, because I think they are proposing once they remove the underground storage tanks to try to do some localized dewatering, but largely also try to treat that water, the groundwater in place, which is called in situ treatment. 
And the dewatering details, again, would be in the remedial action work plan, at least more information about how they would go about it. Um, and they'll need to either, if they, there's two ways of managing the water once you pump it out of the ground. One is to dispose of it. The other is to treat it on site. Um, and if they're going to treat it on site, they have to have you know, a means of doing that. Um, they would have to have storage tanks to hold the water, a treatment system to run the water through, and then a means of disposing or, dis or, or discharging the treated water. So the other option, again, is to tank it off, have tanker trucks come on and, and or trucks or of any type that would carry the water to wherever it was going. These are decisions that are largely uh, a combination of factors. Can they treat the water reasonably effectively on site? Do they have the space to keep the, un to the tanks on site while they're doing the other activities on site? Is it you know, cost effective to do that? Is it more cost effective just to uh, manage it in an offsite disposal scenario or vice versa? Is it more cost effective to treat it on site? So these are all variables I'm sure that they're, work they're looking at now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, uh, Paul and Laura, on that. Uh, Jason Friedman. Hey, Jason. Welcome. Hi. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Yes. Hi. So um, I had a question. A bunch of us live right across the street, and mm -hmm. um, and people are kind of starting to ask questions in my building about you know, should we uh, be hiring someone like you or someone that you might recommend offline to do some sort of baseline study of our buildings across the street? Uh, mm -hmm. Would it be appropriate to do that before all this soil comes out? And, um, and you know, because a lot of people, there's like these, you know, there's been talk about this sinkhole on the site and Mm -hmm. And people are saying uh, that it's growing and, and our streets are narrow. And I just want to make sure that when all this soil work happens, that, you know, mm -hmm. if, if those of us who want to make sure that nothing happens to our foundations, which are like 40 feet away, mm -hmm. um, is there any time where that's kind of outlined how that's, you know, some prevent preventing our buildings from sinking as their soil comes out? Um. <sighs> The, it, the the nature of the work here being that it would be um, peeling up the asphalt that's there, um, not no demolition to speak of because there's no existing structure. Um, I would have to look, I mean, I have to have a little bit more information about what exactly the sequence of events are going to be. And, and I'd like to essentially comment on that when the draft remedial action work plan comes out. Um, to have a better understanding of, you know, what would need to be established as a baseline. If the concern is any effect on the structural uh, integrity of the surrounding buildings, um, that's really outside my area of expertise. Um, it's not uncommon, however, for baseline building structural evaluations to be done prior to major uh, development in a, an urban area. Uh, especially if there's a structural foundation proposed, which I would imagine would be the case here. Uh, but again, I don't have that specific information um, uh, to opine on. But let's say there's piles that are going to be driven and there's potentially, you know, vibrations related to the pile driving, if that's the kind of foundation that's being recommended. Um, it's not uncommon to have a baseline um, uh, structural evaluation conducted uh, and to do things like vibration monitoring around the construction of a, a building or an, a major redevelopment or a major soil removal activity that would require large pieces of equipment being used. Um, the other thing that it can and has been done on other projects I've been involved with is settlement monitoring. You can actually uh, retain the services of, of a company, professional services company that do settlement and vibration monitoring to be able to have a before, during, and after evaluation of the integrity of buildings surrounding the property that's being redeveloped. Um, these are things that, um, again, I, I can't 
I don't I don't don't have right now where I sit enough information to say yes or no, but uh, it is definitely something that is uh, there are professional services companies out there that provide those services. One kind of follow up to oh, hold on. Uh, when is the dirt coming out in the next phase or after that phase? The um, Twenty feet you spoke of. Yeah, that that the the remedial action plan um, will lay out what the proposed remediation scope is, and this this draft RI report uh, lays out what that remedial action work plan or what what the general approach to the remediation will be, and it does involve removal of soil, um, and it you know involves the removal of the underground underground storage tanks and the impacted soil related to those and the dewatering in order to access the soil that they need to remove and to do the um, foundation installation. Um, so that will be in the next document that gets submitted, the draft remedial action work plan. Okay. Jason, you okay there? Are you done? Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you both. Bob Schneck. Okay, uh, I have a couple of questions. Thank you so much for following up with this. Uh, yes. It's really important. Your advice is very significant here. I was wondering, is the process of remediation separate from the process of development? Is it after the remediation, can the remediation happen and then the site be capped and then it can wait for development or is it, is it usual that you do the remediation and then the development, or you wait till the development set up and to do the. Is there something, some kind of connection there? What can we expect, typically? Right. No, that's a very good question. And and typically on a brownfield site where the remediation is being done in preparation for redevelopment, there's the two activities are integrated together, so that the remediation is addressing the issues that need to be addressed for purposes of redevelopment and for purposes of compliance and for purposes of protection of human health and, and the environment. All these goals are integrated together. Typically, the remediation will be done and initiated and then the redevelopment related construction activities would follow. And typically it would follow in a, in a short time frame, and, and even often, depending upon the site and depending upon the work involved, the two would overlap each other, where you would start remediation on one side of the site and initiate and complete that, and then redevelopment related construction would start in the area once you're done with the remediation, and then it would continue on. This is a small site, and it does have a lot of logistical challenges because of the size of it and the orientation of it and its location surrounded you know, by sensitive receptors, which obviously Langan and HHCs fully recognize. You've got the streets on all four sides. You've got narrow streets, as was mentioned before. Um, these are all logistical challenges, but they can be addressed. It's a question of just designing the approach to the remediation and the redevelopment so that it gets done effectively and safely. Um, and it can be done it, safely. It, it's just a question of the logistics and the planning and the components and how it's going to be uh, worked together. It is not uncommon at all for there to be a delay between the end of a remediation and a start of a redevelopment for any number of reasons. Um, in those instances, if there is a delay there may need to be work that the uh, responsible part, the person doing the remediation might have to do as a temporary measure to ensure that the site is safe, you know, and uh, that there's a protection of human health and the environment while the work related to the construction is um, uh, being planned. So it's not uncommon for that to happen. Uh, it really depends upon, uh, you know, the schedule and how all the pieces pull together. Um, I think ideally from the perspective of um, 
having it be a seamless operation, you'd want to have one activity, the remediation start, and have the redevelopment related construction activities at our subsurface and therefore interact with the cleanup. You want to have those integrated. Um, but there's any number of ways in which it can be done and done safely. It just may mean that you might have to, let's say, backfill an excavation after you're done instead of leaving it open to enable the redevelopment to occur if there's too much time between the two. Um, not, not an ideal scenario because now you may have to re excavate material that you just placed down in the ground, um, but it's something that could be looked at and it could be factored in. Thank does, you. Does this I'll mean have another? Okay. Does, yeah, I have a, I have two more. Sure. One. Uh, I was wondering, does this mean that the developer is the decision making maker going forward, so they decide about the timing and when this should happen, and if the remediation should start now or when it starts? Well, I think it's you know the it's the goals are laid out by the BCP program. So the developer in this case HHC is responsible for implementing the remediation. They've taken on that responsibility. They are volunteering to do it. Um, the timing of when that's going to start is going to be a discussion between them and the agencies. The remedial action work plan will have a schedule of the total duration of the activities. I mean, I haven't spoken to anybody specifically about whether the schedule will have any kind of start date. Normally it doesn't unless there is a start date that's been clearly established with which often in a remedial action work plan, especially a draft remedial action work plan, the, the, the calendar dates aren't on there because number one, it's draft and it's still subject to agency review and public review in this case. And then it's subject to revision. So typically it would just have a duration calendar. It wouldn't have a start date. Um, but ultimately there'll be a discussion between the, the developer and the agencies as to the overall timing because the way the remediation is being proposed, the means and the methods have to comply with, you know, what the agencies anticipate are going to, is going to be necessary for protection of public health and the environment. So if there's going to be a delay, they need to address what happens during that delay. If there's not going to be a delay, then they need to explain that to the best of their ability and you know, there may be some adjustment to the overall schedule depending upon circumstances. Um, it's not uncommon for draft remedial action work plans to go in with a schedule of an overall duration. And then once it's finalized, to have that schedule adjusted slightly to meet what's actually happening once the document's been finalized, you know, because things change, you know, uh, as time goes by, certain durations for certain activities might need to be adjusted. So it, it is a dialogue that's going to happen. And, and the public will have an opportunity to comment because there's a 45 day public uh, comment period after the draft remedial action work plan is issued. Thank you. So is a, can I have a final question? Uh, okay. Uh, my final question is, since this site is surrounded by schools and businesses and local residences, are there yes. any special dangers of remediation that they should be aware of or prepare for timing of schools and so on? Um, from the beginning with the draft remedial investigation work plan, the community air monitoring uh, program was designed for the protection of the community and the residents and for the public to the public passers by anybody in the immediate vicinity when the investigation was being conducted. That same community air monitoring program idea is also incorporated into the remediation. So there will be a construction health and safety plan for the workers and for the management of the construction activities. There'll be a community air monitoring plan that will be incorporated into the remedial action work plan. Um, there'll be means and measures for best management practices to ensure that you know, contaminated soil doesn't get tracked off site into the roadways. Um, there needs to be a dialogue when the draft remediation work plan is issued. 
there needs to be a dialogue to ensure that what's being proposed is something that's deemed um, you know, safe for the public and for the residents surrounding the site. So until we see the draft remedial action work plan, I can't really comment on whether or not what they're gonna propose is acceptable and in my view, in my professional opinion, appropriate uh, until we see it. Right, thanks very but, much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for all the information. Yes. Yeah, Michael Kramer, thank you. Okay, my first question is about sequence. Um, could you give you give us your best estimate about the earliest a work plan would be finalized and perhaps the latest you expect the work plan to be finalized? Well, it's my understanding from DEC that the draft remedial action work plan is supposed to be submitted to the agencies in the next few weeks. Um, from there, there's a 45 day public comment period in the citizen participation participation plan for the site in the in the community participation plan, whatever you want to call it. So assuming that that 45 day comment period is not extended, um, you're looking there at about a 60 day time frame approximately for the public comments to be received. You know, two or three weeks, two weeks, let's say from now, two or three weeks, 45 days, and then the public comment period closes. And then the agencies have to then provide their final requests to Langan and HHC as to what they want to see uh, in the remedial action work plan if, if, if they want adjustments made to it. During that time frame, if you are going to continue with a community consultant, the community consultant will also be working with the community to provide additional comments to the agencies but that would all be within that 45 day time frame. So then there would need to be a certain amount of time for Langan and HHC to review those comments and have dialogue with the agencies. And then depending on the outcome of that, finalize the remedial action work plan. So, so it is a, a process. Um, going back to when we did the draft remedial investigation work plan, you know, it, it took a few months um, I, I don't recall the exact time frame, but I don't think it's reasonable to think that that time frame is not it's going to be, you know, four or five, six months. I mean, it could be shorter than that if if everything goes very smoothly. Uh, it could be longer than that if there's more comments than the agencies expected, or if there's any disagreements, or something happens with just taking longer to finalize the dialogue and the document. So it's it, it really depends on a lot of the moving parts that go along with the project like this. So as early as July and perhaps as late as September or October. Yeah, and again, I'm just talking from what we know right now in terms of when the agencies anticipate the draft from election work plan to be submitted. Um, I, I believe that you know, they were hopeful that it would come in as close to the issuance of this draft RI report as possible so that some of the questions that are being asked tonight can be answered a little bit more definitively um, because we really need that second document to be able to better understand, you know, and in, uh, what the proposed approach is going to look like. Well, as you know, they, they, they have to go through a mountain of work with the landmarks and with the land use it's not an as of right uh, development. Mm -hmm. Once you, they have the final uh, work plan approved, do they have to do that work within a certain period of time? Um, in accordance with you know the the way typically these projects proceed, there's a continued dialogue between the responsible entity taking on the volunteer work and the agencies. You know, the agencies know what's there now at the site. Currently, under the current conditions, you know, there's no exposure to, you know, the public. Um, there are concerns over subsidence and the sinkhole formation, but those are being addressed when they happen. So the dialogue is going to continue between the parties. The agencies would like to see the work done sooner than later. And they're going to recognize that, Langan Agency, but at the same time, they need to have the other pieces in place in order to be able to proceed. Um, 
I really can't speak for the agencies with respect to whether or not they would mandate a certain time frame because this work is being done as a, you know, HHC is a volunteer. Um, they're committed to doing the work. They're committed to proceeding with the remediation. Um, the ongoing dialogue is what typically keeps, you know, uh, both parties, you know, in communication. Um, and if something happens, which would change the, the commitment of the developer to, to proceed with this, then, you know, the agencies at that point, if that's the, if that's what they feel is happening, then they may decide to take action. Um, but because there's no imminent threat that the site currently poses to the public or to the environment, um, beyond just maintenance of those sinkhole areas and maintenance of the overall asphalt, uh, I think that this is something that will, um, uh, the agencies would likely give them time to try to work through. Um, so it gets complicated if there is a situation where they're, you know, now not looking like they're going to proceed with the work and the agencies then have to make a decision as to whether or not they think they need to, you know, do anything more aggressive with the, the volunteer. So that's really getting beyond conjecture. So I don't really want to go there. And, and and if if they were to take these approvals and entitlements and and decide that they wanted to sell it to the next guy, would they have to start all over again? Who would who have to start all over again? The, the, the owner, if the owner were to sell the property to somebody else, would this whole process start all over again? Um, I I think that if the remediation work plan has been prepared and approved, that that would be the remedy that would be in that would be implemented um there might be some modification to it depending upon the future use of the site if the future use of the site changes there could be some modification to the remedial action work plan that would be appropriate based upon the future use changing um but the process would not have to start all over again in terms of uh, investigation. There would not have to be additional investigation done, no additional RI work. You wouldn't be going backwards as if nothing ever was done, because now you've got this remedial investigation report that documents all media, soil, soil vapor, groundwater, um, and characterizes what's out there. The, rem the remediation work plan will be acknowledging that the site's being redeveloped for a specific use and it'll integrate the pieces of that redevelopment into the remedy in a manner that makes sense for that end use and complies with the regulations and is protective of human health and the environment so if the end use changes there might be some you know some adjustment of that remedial action work plan scope if the end use was going to be exactly the same then then there were, may not be any modification required or very little modification. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Michael. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thanks. So I'm, I'm going to open it up to um, outside of the committee to the attendees. Um, I see a lot of folks from children first. Welcome. Thanks so much for coming. I assume your questions will be <laughs> distinct um, from each other. Uh, just in interest of time, just to not uh, make a, an unnecessary overlap if possible. Uh, thanks. Uh, Grace Lee, welcome. Hi, thank you, Alice. And thank you, Laura, for being here. Mm -hmm. um, so during your comments, you talked about how um, the remediation that you're expecting to occur in certain parts of the lot will be great or deeper than a typical remediation might call for because they need to dig deeper for the foundation for the building that is expected. I just wonder, is that right? Um, well, actually, it's uh, close. Um, okay. there, there'll be areas where, based on the building design, they may have to excavate a little deeper than they would have otherwise had to in order to address the hot spots because the historic fill itself if it's not also affected by either the mercury at elevated concentrations or 
the underground storage tank releases, you know, with the petroleum products. Other than in those locations and maybe one or two other minor things, um, they might not have to remove the historic fill and typically they wouldn't remove the historic fill, they would be capping it. Um, but the historic fill itself, if they have to remove it in order to put the building foundation in a little bit deeper, I mean, there is actually a, a benefit environmentally to the site, to the property, because now you're removing material that, you know, getting down to the top of the water table or below where you're not going to have this material remaining behind anymore. Um, mm -hmm. um, so, I, so there is not an approved development or building approved plan, sorry, for this, for this lot yet. How is the DEC going to determine the adequacy of the remediation if they don't know how deep the foundation needs to go and what is going to be built on that site? Well, I think the remedial action work plan, I, I can't say for sure because it hasn't been issued yet and it's still being prepared. I think the remedial action work plan will uh, talk about the depths of excavation relative to what HHC is currently uh, planning or what they envision. Um, and if there needs to be an adjustment made to it, as I said earlier, it's not uncommon for there to be adjustments made after a meal action work plan is issued if something related to the redevelopment is adjusted. Um, the, the most important aspect of just the remedial action itself is to address the hot spots, the material that can't stay behind, that needs to be removed, and as long as that is being covered, if they're going deeper and taking more historic fill out than they would otherwise, that's not going to really change the ability for the agency to approve it. It's really a matter of how much soil removal will be involved and, and perhaps the duration of the work might be adjusted. For instance, if they were not going to go as deep, they might not remove as much material, the duration might be shorter. If if there were if they needed to go deeper in a location after the final plan is developed, then they might have to adjust and remove a little bit more historic fill or even some native soil that they weren't initially planning on. All of that would affect the total volume of material and the duration of the work. But as long as the elements that have to have to be in the remediation work plan from an environmental compliance perspective are in there, then you know that those types of adjustments um, are, are, are acceptable typically. Um, and again, the means and methods are gonna have to be explained and, and worked out in the remediation work plan. Um, Thanks, Laura. And, mm -hmm. and sorry, because Alice, I don't want you to make this multi-part question. I just want yeah, to follow ahead. up really quickly on this. Sure. On that. At, is there, are there limitations on when those adjustments can be made during, I mean, can they do it while they're doing the work? So I guess that I'm trying to figure out by what time does a plan need to be finalized for development so that they know exactly while, while they're remediating what, what exactly, what type of work and how deep they need to go. Um, it, it, it's not uncommon. I mean, we've, I've worked on many projects over the years where we had a very specific plan and we were able to integrate it into the remediation work plan and nothing needed to change before we got to the field or even during the, the field work. But I've also had equally as many sites probably where we had a very generic plan and we knew we had to excavate the hot spots. We knew we had to treat groundwater or soil in another portion of the site in order to comply with the regulations and address these um, impacts, but that we didn't know the exact uh, design of the long-term redevelopment. So we addressed that in more general terms and we're able to get the um, work plan approved because it's compliant as long as we're explaining why we're proceeding that way and we're providing all the best management practices to explain how the soil is going to be excavated, how it's going to be handled on site, how it's going to be transported off site, 
all of those pieces that go along with protection of human health and the environment. So it, it really falls into both camps. Um, and it's, again, it's a, the remedial action work plan can be a fluid document. Um, and, and in some, you know, in many cases, because, you know, this type of work is based upon your best estimate of what has to happen when you're in the field. Um, but there are things that occur in the field that require you to make adjustments. And the agencies are well aware of that. So, you know, I think that the document should be comprehensive and it should explain all this um, in order for, you know, the community to understand what's being envisioned as far as how the work would be done. Thanks. Um, mm -hmm. are, are you set, um, Grace, any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Megan Melbourne. Welcome. You guys hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, that never works. I'm so happy. Thanks. Um, or I, 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 I'm forgotten that your bad mojo switched over to my good mojo. Um, so first of all, thank you, Alice. <laughs> thank you, Alice and Grace. I really appreciate uh, all this effort and thought that goes into this. Um, my first quick question is, um, would Howard Hughes and Lillian ever have um, speciated for elemental mercury if we were not involved? Um, oh gosh, you're making me go back to the remedial investigation work plan days um, to determine if that they never came... speak, and they said they didn't have to because they don't under eyes of the New York State um, Health Department and such that it's not a it's not a part of a brownfield. So based on that, would they have ever speciated for elemental mercury? I, I really can't say whether they would have ever done it or not, Megan. And as I sit here, I just don't recall whether or not that was a specific question or comment that came from us or from me. Um, no. I do know, I, I do know, no, hold on. I, I do know that we had a lot of dialogue with the agencies about the concern over elemental mercury. And I believe that the proposal to speciate came from the discussions that were ongoing during the time that we were talking about the the scope of the remedial investigation work plan, so so is it not without our hold, hold on. yeah is it something but but I I can also say is it something that's super common to do speciation? It it's not it's not super common. I mean in all the years I've done what I'm doing, um, I would say out of uh, I can't even count how many sites I've worked on. Uh, probably less than 10 has speciation of any type for any type of metal been done. It isn't super common. Here, it was appropriate to do. It was absolutely appropriate to do because this gives us a much better understanding of what type of mercury is in the ground and therefore a much better idea and a much more informed data-driven process of determining, you know, what can be expected when the soil excavation activities take place. Um, Especially like, since I, there was decades of uh, historical uh, indication that there would be elemental mercury there. But my right. point is, right. without you mm -hmm. and without us, I don't think that speciation mm -hmm. would have happened because, as you just said, it's not typical. So that's my first plug for why yeah. we need Laura going forward. <laughs> I want to talk about her um, having her contract to go move forward with us. But um, one real quick question about because like you have all these decades of experience with remediation. Is it is yes. it a is it a is it a quiet process? Is it unnoticeable like on a scale of zero to a hundred? How with you know trucks and all pumps and uh, you know all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, the yeah, I mean, obviously, when you're sitting parking cars, the noise level is is what you're used to every day. Um, when you're bringing heavy equipment onto the site and you're starting to remove asphalt and you're starting to excavate, it's not going to be as quiet as parking cars. So, okay, so that's one, just one quick thing. We know it's loud. 
Okay. We, we, it, there's, there's definitely going to be noise related to any construction activity in the city. Everybody knows that. And, and the question, though, becomes best management practices and what can be done to try to mitigate um, the disturbance to the community. And, and that's definitely something that we'll be looking at um, in the review of the draft room election work plan, assuming that that, that that document is detailed enough with respect to that. I think the concerns that the community has with respect to noise is something that can be expressed by the community when the draft room election work plan is issued. Because remember, you have that 45 day comment period. My, I guess my follow up to that, though, as far as mitigation is concerned, we mm -hmm. mitigate how much noise and disruptive behavior comes from it is to only open up the asphalt once and then build the development afterwards. You said that is an ideal situation. As you do the remediation, you're doing the work to start the building. Doing um, what I think you referred to as a temporary measure and then having mm -hmm. to rip that apart is only going to expose the kids and the nearby residents to double the sort of trauma of um, ripping apart asphalt. So I guess my point, I just think that as far as what would be the best outcome and gating the noise for the kids is to, mm -hmm. I don't even know if Howard Hughes is on here right now, if anyone, because I can't see in the chat, I would just ask that they don't start the remediation process until there's a building plan in place. That's just a personal request from a parent um, that please don't do it, get it all organized, get it approved. But please don't start the remediation until you have an approved plan. I would love for you to ask Howard to use that, just on the term of being the best case scenario for the kids as possible. Maybe right. it's a good point, and they are on on, the, on this call. Um, thanks very much. Um, so we are now at 7:15. I'm going to take a few more uh, hands that I see here. Thank you, Megan, and thank you to to Children First for having brought this to the community's attention. I think it, it's benefited everyone tremendously. Um, Maggie DeLal. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. thank you. Hi, Laura, thanks for your time tonight. Um, oh, I just cool. like, had some questions about like some technical stuff in the report. Mm -hmm. um, I had some time this week to look over some of the data and obviously you know, thinking about the neighborhood and the kids wanted to, you know, check the numbers for um, the air monitoring station. Um, mm -hmm. The equipment that you guys use was the Jerome 405, which has a detection limit of 0 0.5 micrograms per meter cubed. Um, since this one is. Um, I'm sorry, there, there was also um, the instrument that had that was uh, more sensitive. Um, uh, the 505 was, 505 handheld, was right? used in the handheld um, uh, air monitor between the work zone and the camp, which was one of the important components of the remedial investigation work plan um, that was added to the original proposal so that there could be air monitoring in real time downwind of where the work was being done and before the community air monitoring uh, system was reached, um, and that was with the more sensitive. Um, right, but the equipment that was at the PM stations surrounding yeah. the border, mm -hmm. that was the 405, right? Right, because the 505 or 504, whatever it is, can't um, be integrated in with telemetry, and that's mm -hmm. the only reason. So I just, I had a question because yeah. some of the, some yeah. of the data that was showed a lot of times it was listed as a zero. The averages were listed as zero, but then you had they had max spike numbers. Right. And some of those numbers were approaching the action level. I mean, I I went through it was about 12 out of 16 of the 17 of the days that where they were doing the work that there were some readings that were approaching the 1.0 um, micrograms per meter cubed action level. Um, For mercury? Yeah, for the mercury vapor. And so I just had a couple questions because I wanted to understand the numbers. I'm not, you know, I'm, I don't have your background. Um, but, you know, some of them are like 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2. So my first question was if the Jerome, the 4 or 5 has a minimum detection level of 0 0.5, 
How mm -hmm. we how are they reporting numbers lower than that? Um, these are averages. I'm I'm not really sure because I'm looking at um. They the were the, the concentrations. The, right. the max spikes. There was another mm -hmm. column on the data table that had. I'm going to just ask that perhaps because in the interest of time, again, the specifics, if they're not readily available to Laura, that she could review the, the specifics that you're asking and get back to us all. Is that a possibility for you, Maggie? Um, it yeah. Be for her to uh, flip 100, for, yeah. Sure, 100 percent. I mean, obviously, this is technical stuff, so I'm I can email her or email you guys and we can. Yeah, why don't we do that? And okay. we'll do that? I will make your responses, Laura, public as well as your question, yeah. Maggie, but I have a feeling this might take longer than, you know, and, and then in fairness to Laura to get to respond. You know, yeah, without, no, listen, I mean, I, you know, she doesn't have no, a no, right. document. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm just looking through the daily reports now and I, I, I'm looking at most of the results for mercury vapor being zero. Um, and I think the reported concentrations, and these are the daily 15 minute average. Um, it wasn't the averages, much, it was the. Yeah, it would be much easier if, well, if the, the averages are going to be obviously not directly correlated to the detection limit. So it, it is best for you to give me the question in writing, and then I can go back and look at the data to make sure that I can, I'm giving you the correct answer. So, okay, so thanks, Maggie. Go ahead and copy yeah. Daniel Sweetai, the director of planning, who's also, of course, on this call, and and that'll we'll take care of getting into right. Laura. Okay. Right, well. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, guys. Okay. Um, okay. We've got Wendy. Uh, hi. Welcome. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was just wondering about the two alarms that went off August 17th and 18th. And just as a community member, right. you know, I didn't hear anything about it. And is it standard practice just to wait 15 minutes and then go back to what you're doing? Yeah, the, the protocols for those alarm uh, criteria, I think that there were some, there were at least two, uh, one or two um, malfunctions of the system that were related to electrical shortages. Um, and I think that's probably what you're referring to. I don't have the dates committed to memory, um, but the protocol for when that happens was followed where, you know, there'd be notification that there's this, this occurred and they would look into what the reason was. And the reason was determined not to be an actual air quality reading. It was determined to be an electrical malfunction. Um, the other reason for having the handheld Jerome J505 on site enabled uh, the on site monitors to be able to verify air quality when those alarm conditions occurred to verify that there wasn't an actual air quality issue. Um, the contractor that ma maintained the, um, uh, the camp units, Emilcott, um, was able to verify the cause of the alarm conditions as well. Um, Thanks. Thank um, you. Are you set there? Okay. I'm. I, I also. I guess I'm just concerned after. Wow, well, that was a really long report. But just reading all the information and just like the talk of all the dust and how just the construction workers would probably be the ones that would be the people that would actually be exposed to this. I don't know. Like, do you think they'll be able to actually? contain the dust that's that's actually one of the most important aspects of work like this um and the best management practices include you know trying to minimize the generation of dust in the first instance you know through misting and and use of spraying of water and other means depending upon the circumstances um if they're excavating when it's wet because they're below the water table that in itself helps to minimize the amount of dust uh, but there's also dust just from, you know, being on the ground surface and tracking with a, with equipment and vehicles. So there needs to be tracking pads uh, for, you know, maintaining the, the trucks that go off the site so that they're not carrying soil or dust on the tires or on the undercarriage of the vehicles. 
And, you know, just from the reading of the overview that they gave in this remedial investigation work plan, those best management practices are going to be integrated into the remedial action work plan. And we'll be looking, I mean, the community needs to look at those carefully uh, to ensure that those best management practices are in there. And then during the performance of the work, they need to be in implementing those best management practices. Um, and this, it, it's definitely a challenge on a site this small, surrounded as this site is by as many, you know, sensitive receptors as, as there are, and with the streets as narrow as they are. Um, it's, it can be done. It has to be done, you know, with intent and with a good plan. And the plan has to be implemented and it needs to be implemented, you know, extremely diligently. So, and that's why the air monitoring would include particulates and, and dust, uh, in addition to other parameters like mercury and total volatile organics. Thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have one more thing. What if there is, I know this is like a government run cleanup. What if there is like a government shutdown? Uh, during the performance of the work? Yeah. Um, well, the the government's not running the project and they're overseeing it um, from a overall compliance perspective. So the if the work is continuing on site during a government shutdown, um, if there was an issue that required input from the DEC or DOH, um, I mean, that would definitely be something that they would have to have dialogue um, with whatever entity they can have during the performance of the work. But, you know, the plan is in place and being implemented. Um, if there's something very unusual that happens, they should be able to manage through, um, you know, a long, long-term government shutdown, I mean, is gonna create challenges for any construction project, whether it be a remediation or anything else. Um, but I mean, the, the communication is some is one of the most critical aspects of any work like this. And I think that was borne out from the development of the remedial investigation work plan and the performance of the remedial investigation. I mean, there was a tremendous amount of dialogue and conversation that took place between Langan and HHC and the community representatives, myself and Tom Facillo, the DEC and the DOH and the public by virtue of posting the daily field reports and the air uh, monitoring data. Um, and there was a lot of dialogue as that work progressed. Um, so that I, I think that really is the key to success is, is the active, uh, effective, and uh, communication. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank um, you. So much. Elaine Kennedy. Hi. Hi, Laura. Hi, Alice. Hi, Hi. Elaine. Hi. Uh, Laura, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit as I usually do. But um, is there at this point, at this juncture, the DEC will decide whether this um, site becomes a uh, significant threat? Uh, can you hear me? The yes. Significant threat, make a significant threat determination. Now, given the nature of all the sensitive receptors in the area, in your opinion, should this site become a significant threat? Determination? Well, we have a, um, a human health exposure, uh, human and qualitative human and fish wildlife exposure assessment is technically the name of the chapter um, that was included in the, in the document. Um, the conclusions are that under the current circ under the current conditions at the site with the pavement, even though there are some issues of subsidence, because those areas are addressed and have been addressed, and there's been no adverse air quality monitor uh, readings in those areas of subsidence. Based upon the data generated during the RI, including the mercury concentrations in soil and in soil vapor, um, that there is no adverse uh, impact to human health in the condition that the site is in right now. So, and there also is no endangered species or any anything of concern with respect to fish and wildlife 
um, just because they don't exist at the site. And so there was no need to do an exposure assessment um, for that portion of the uh, uh, of the uh, evaluation. So, what about during the remediation? During the remediation, the um, potential for exposure exists. Um, they come out and state that very clearly in the exposure assessment. Um, there lies the importance of the proposed scope and approach that's going to be used for the remedial action and the best management practices that will go into play during the performance of that work, including what we just talked about with the controlling any contaminated soil and making sure it's not tracked off site, keeping dust and, and any generation of particulates you know, in the ambient air below action levels, which you know, again, the action levels will be discussed in the remediation work plan. The camp will include action levels for dust and particulates, volatile organics and mercury. Um, the community air monitoring plan obviously is a very important part of it, as are just again, general best management practices for how they handle excavated soil on site, how they load the trucks, how they um, make sure that the trucks are not tracking soil in the on the tires or in the undercarriage of the vehicle before it exits the property. Um, how they control generation of vapors during excavation, um, and we're talking not just uh, we're talking underground storage tank related petroleum um, uh, issues. We're talking any volatile organic vapor that might be generated because they're exposing the subsurface, uh, even though there really wasn't much in the way of you know, overall volatile organic issues uh, at the site and really nothing generated during the RI itself. Um, and of course, monitoring for the potential for there uh, to be mercury vapor generation. So that's where the, the emphasis will be during the performance of the remediation. Um, and that will be neat. You would, the community needs to be looking at those pieces when the draft remedial action work plan gets issued. It seems like a lot of this will be answered in part two of the, when you get to the remedial work uh, action plan. So I know the community board is very interested in having you continue. And if there's no objections, I'm sure that the committee would like to probably propose a resolution. Um, if there are any objections, let me know from the committee members. I'm going to take a couple more questions. We really have an, I did, uh, we have an immense uh, agenda in front of us to look at the lower Manhattan Coast Resiliency Plans as well tonight. So I'm going to ask that if there is any repetition here, please to not ask your question. And additionally, Laura, if you could just to be as brief as possible, if you can, mm -hmm. just so we can allow uh, the folks who've come from all the other agencies to to have a moment here. So um, sure. I think, did I, uh, I think Carrie Shanley, have you sp spoken up yet? A quick question you have, or did it? Um, no, not yet, but thank you very much. Just wanna okay. make sure you can hear me. Yep. Yes. Great, okay. So here's my question, which is, um, first off, but I'm hoping that there is consideration to hire Laura through the, um, 45-day comment period. I think it's really important considering her history for the community to be able to continue to get this unbiased. Yes, I just uh, mentioned that. Yes, we are we are interested in that. Thanks, Carrie, and we are going to uh, uh, look into that. Yes. Emily Hellstrom. Hey, Emily. Emily, are you there? Can you hear me? Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Oh, great. Thanks so much. And thanks, uh, Laura, for being here and Alice for yeah. um, presenting this. Um, I'm just curious because, you know, the, the remedial work plan is set out by Howard Hughes and Langen. Is that correct? Not the DEC? And, and the reason I ask is because it would seem to me that you know, I, I totally recognize that Howard Hughes is absolutely committed to this process and that they volunteered to go in this process. I understand that they get, you know, tax incentives in order to do this, but that they are committed to it and that they have, have hired you, which is great. Um, or at least they've paid to have you be on, on our team. 
But what I don't understand is that obviously they have shareholders that they need to answer for uh, too. And obviously this is a very sensitive site with a lot of very complicated processes but it would be in their interest to not spend a lot of money. And I'm not saying that they're gonna take shortcuts, but by the same token, they do want to keep the costs down. So is this like some kind of like little tit for tat negotiation type of thing? Or does the DEC say, no, this is how dangerous it is. It is. This is what you need. <clears throat> well, well, the process under the BCP program is being adhered to and the remedial investigation report that was just issued is prepared by the consultant on behalf of the volunteer, which is HHC. And then the remedial action work plan is similarly drafted and uh, proposed and submitted to the agencies for review. And then, as we talked about before, there's a 45 day public comment period. So the agencies review the document and what's being proposed um, in its entirety. And the public also has an opportunity to comment. So HHC and, Langen, no um, HHC and Langen understand what has to be done Whoa. in order to comply. Good job. High five. Um, my bathroom. I love that. There's some background noise? Yeah, so if you could mute yourself, I'm not sure if um, the problem is, but someone has yeah. a so so HHC and Langan understand what needs to be done for compliance with the BCP program requirements and with the DEC 10 requirements for a remedial action work plan um, and the agencies um, are going to be reviewing that if they feel that there's anything not acceptable in the remedial action work plan you know they will surely comment on it um, and and this document also has that 45 day public comment period uh, which enables the community to also comment on anything that they feel um, is not appropriate, you know, not uh, in, uh, doesn't comply with the regulations or doesn't make sense for the site from a technical or scientific or, or human health and the environment uh, protection of human health and the environment perspective. Um, so it, it's a just like we opined when when we commented on the remedial investigation work plan. Um, there are very extensive regulations out there and the process should be data driven and, you know, the remedial investigation was a data data driven process. Um, and I think that process will continue um, and the agencies have done a good job in, in, you know, providing their comments and responding to ours. Okay, thanks. Um, Victoria? Yes, hello. Hello, everyone. Hi, welcome. Hi, Laura. This is Victoria. Uh, we have had uh, quite a bit of experience with this, uh, with the Greenwich Hotel that was also built on a parking lot uh, that caused the damage to our lofts on 37 permits and a certificate of appropriateness. So there were a few things that the community spoke to. Um, I, I just want to briefly overview uh, howard hughes in theory when they are going down more than 10 grade they are to survey the surrounding landmarks and shore them up so that we know that there were problems in our case uh, there were certainly problems at 287 broadway the tilting landmark next to 57 reed so that the biggest thing that laura has said that I heard is mm -hmm. the size of the space, the size of the cobblestone streets, what is surrounding this this site. And of course she's giving the best case scenario, but when you have 150 journeymen uh, with all of those tools in their hands and their trucks, we were very fortunate to have Frank Rubes from the LMCCC uh, because the Greenwich Hotel was built with Liberty Bond money. And the developer, BD Hotels, was fined out the yin yang. Uh, it, it was absolutely a nightmare. And I got walking pneumonia from it being so close. So I, I just wanted to, to put that out there for the neighbors. It seems that based on your findings, that LPC would need to readdress this. Which brings me back to my real question for you, Laura, is mm -hmm. the perspective damage to 
neighbors and certainly the surrounding landmarks and in our case three landmarks uh, were damaged by the Greenwich Hotel that went down three floors instead of one hit the water line failing to survey the surrounding landmarks damaged 64 Northmore 71 Northmore 385 Greenwich and uh, 64 Northmore uh, 61 Northmore I'm sorry Christy Turlington's building so that um, my question to you Laura is if in fact Howard Hughes would stay within the historic district's limitations, would this uh, present less of a danger, an environmental danger? Certainly, the cobblestone streets are at risk. These buildings are date back to, in our case, 1805 and 1815, and the landmarks were damaged. People got sick. Um, so I, I'm just wondering your point of view, if this was scaled back to the actual height requirements of a historic district, which is really why they're there, would many of these concerns that are not easy to navigate once they get the permits, would that, in other words, if Howard Hughes would act within the historic district's limitations, instead of forcing the square hole, a square peg into a round hole, what would that then the impact be to the community? I hope that made sense. It sounds you get that. Well, it sounds like being asked. If I just can quickly translate it. It's just if, if it were a building that were smaller without the two towers, would, you know, that was in fact a, a scale that is allowed as of right today. Would that somehow uh, mitigate some of the environmental concerns? I think that's what I'm hearing as a question. Correct yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Right. Um, well, my role as the environmental consultant for the community is really to speak directly to issues related to the things we've been talking about, you know, the tracking of soil, the generation of dust, the minimizing all of that, and the protection of air quality for the residents, as well as the best management practices during the physical movement of soil, the management of water, um, making sure vehicles are not um, tracking contaminated soil in and out, uh, addressing issues of noise to the extent possible, you know, knowing that this is construction that we're talking about. Um, with respect to um, the possible damage to adjacent structures, um, it's really outside my area of expertise. Um, as I indicated in, in the beginning when that question was asked, um, you know, I know that there are measures that can be taken to do a pre-construction survey of existing building conditions. Um, and monitoring, monitoring that can be done, vibration monitoring, settlement monitoring, but those are areas outside of my area of expertise and not things that I'm really um, retained to, to comment on. Um, so I, I would simply say I'm gonna have to, that, that, that what you yeah. said was required is a major stress on, on a historic district. In, in required in terms of? Well, it, 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 these are cobblestone streets. These mm -hmm. are buildings that, that, that the deep back to, isn't it the 1600s in the seaports, that this mm -hmm. is much, that kind of excavation puts serious, puts the surrounding landmarks a neighbor because of the narrowness, because mm -hmm. it's such a small site, that those right. were the two biggest things that you said, and mm -hmm. it raises serious red, red flags to me. I think it's a very important point, Victoria. It's one that we definitely want to address, I think, because Laura's stating that's not in her um, particular area, but I think it's something that the community should definitely highlight in an upcoming resolution when we look at the remedial work uh, plan. So right. uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask, I think there's just two more people, Chris, very, uh, Chris and Tom, very quickly, in the next five minutes, I'd like to uh, wrap this up. So Chris, you have something? Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. We can't hear yeah, you. Can. Oh, there you go. Hi. Hi. Audible. Hi, Sorry. Yep. Hi. I, I was just I, the the previous question that that came through about the alarms that went off and. And on the 17th and 18th of August, or, or whenever those dates were, and then one of the comments was, "Oh well, the government doesn't oversee this at all." And we'll have to no, that. I, I, I didn't say that. Have to be on the checklist of things that are happening 
and when does it get when does that get recorded and when does the, the disclosure become to government to public and and how does that information get disseminated because you know there's lots of tributaries there and unless you know where which one to swim down you're never going to find out that information so right um I, I i just need to know and understand what is the true key governmental institution that will be overseeing what's going down here with with hh and mm -hmm. uh when they do start to remediate that and that's my question and i'll, I'll take it offline bye thanks you're welcome. Um, first of all, I don't think I said that the government doesn't monitor it. I said that in the event of a government shutdown, um, the procedures will be followed that were put in place by the approved plans. And that's what happened during the remedial investigation uh, implementation. Um, and it would be the DEC and the DOH working in tandem uh, as they did during the entire RI implementation. And uh, part of the remedial investigation work plan that we commented on and the agencies responded and ultimately Langan and HHC did incorporate um, was uh, DEC set up a website, um, 250bcp.com, uh, um, or is it 250watersheetbcp.com, I, I, I'm sorry, where all of the daily failed logs were updated or, or uploaded so that the community had access to those through the website. Um, that was a request uh, and a comment that we provided to the agencies on the draft remedial investigation work plan in order to ensure that there was a little bit more transparency and information provided to the community. And I think that process worked very well. Um, so the agencies were aware that there was um, an alarm condition and they were aware and apprised of what the, the basis of it was. So the DEC and the DOH will remain involved um, as the remedial action um, process proceeds. Okay, thank you. I think we have finally hit the end of the questions. I thank the community, just tremendous questions that are really helpful to us to start to consider Hello. What we want to Hello? summarize um, as we go forward, right. and um, uh, I just want to say that unless there's a, an objection, we're going to have a resolution um, in support of having Laura uh, uh, continue on behalf of the community board. If Howard Hughes is amenable, that's to be seen. And I want to thank Howard Hughes as well for coming out tonight and also for helping out with the ability to have the independent contractor. Um, so uh, I think um, I would ask Tom, I'll get you just Alex? a second. I see you've raised your hand. You'll sure. have to wait a minute. Let me just okay. finish. Yep. I might. Um, uh, that we will also have a resolution, of course, on the action work plan. I'll very much look forward to compiling all the notes tonight, as well as ones that I hope the community will continue to send through. Things that you'd like to see in that once um, we get to review it. And um, I will let Tom Burton have a quick something that I see he's just appeared. I'm a member of our committee. Go ahead, Tom, quickly, because we're going to wrap up now. Yeah, um, I just uh, I had a, a, a general question, but uh, as it relates to uh, the soil, I understand that there's, there's the uh, the water gets remediated either on site or off site. What happens to the soil and uh, you know, is there a way to, you know, if we're ensuring that things are done clean and we try not to take the not in my backyard approach, you know, is can we see a 360 degree view of how whatever happens here is done responsibly and so the environment somewhere else isn't harmed? I think we're jumping back to the same question you've answered, if I'm not mistaken, that this is in the next phase. But go ahead, Laura, if you want to quickly summarize that. Or... <clears throat> Going to if, if I understand the question, um, you're saying that if the soil that the hot spot soils that have to be removed and disposed of will be sent to a permitted facility based upon the quality of the soil itself and the material. So the soil will go likely to different places depending upon the quality of it. So the soil that has mercury, higher concentrations of mercury may have to go someplace different than soil that has just petroleum hydrocarbons uh, impacted from the underground storage tank area. And the soil that's not really exhibiting any of that 
material but is sort of the historic fill um, material that's been characterized at the site, that soil may go to a, a third location or even a fourth location. It depends on the quality of the soil itself. And there are a number of different facilities that can be, that are permitted to accept material like this. Um, and these are facilities depending upon the quality of the soil. Some of them are, um, you know, there, there could be a beneficial reuse to some of the material. I mean, there's all different options that are available, not the mercury impacted material, but the historic fill. And it really depends on, you know, the volumes um, and it depends on timing, of whether or not a facility can receive material when the material is being excavated. So there's a lot of moving parts yeah. to it. Um, but uh, I think I guess that- my question, that, that's not really my question. My question is as a community that uh, are gonna see construction projects today and in the future, uh, mm -hmm. that I, I, I'm on the Environmental Protection Committee, but I don't actually understand what happens to excavated toxic soil that it's we a, Tom it's a great a, question I'm going to ask Laura to take I'm going to take it offline we're going to we have a few people who did not get to fully get a response to their questions tonight for just because of the virus at end to the evening alas so Laura if you we will get get your question from Tom and along yeah. with others I think Victoria yeah, also I, totally answered and a few others and if you could get back to us on those um, yeah absolutely Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your unbelievable. Alice, you asked about a resolution. So if there's a, you need to reiterate that and see if there's a call for a second to pass a vote if you need one. I will do that. Thanks, Tammy. So um, first I was asking if anyone objected to a resolution, but you're right. I need a second for a resolution to ask that we continue having Laura Dodge as our independent community consultant on this project. Do I have um, somebody to second that? Second. I'll second it. Great. All right. Okay. So we're set with that and the resolution will be rather simple, but it will be asking for Laura. Okay. Diana, can you take a vote? Oh uh, yeah, Tammy, unless you object, I'm just going to call for any objections, abstentions or recused. All good for me. Okay. Are there any in objection? Any recused? Any abstaining? All right. It is unanimous. Thank you. Thanks, Tammy, for the process reminder, and thanks everyone, and thank you also for the, all the folks who have so patiently waited, and mostly to Laura. Thank you, and again, Howard Hughes, and all the community folks who uh, have all these really terrific questions. Okay. Great. So thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on very quickly to uh, the Lower Manhattan quarterly resiliency update. Hard to believe that's right. happening tonight as well. And so I'm going to get off. Thank you again. Thanks, Laura. Thank you Wait, very much. Take care. Um, so we're going to. St I think I. I don't know if I can think it's Will Fisher. Okay, Will Fisher, uh, EDC Government and Community Relations. Uh, I think it's going to, and Jordan Salinger from the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. I guess you guys are heading it off. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, you know, thank you to Alice, uh, Tammy, and, and Diana for, for having us tonight. Uh, my name is Jordan Salinger uh, with the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Uh, for folks that are, are joining us for the first time, uh, these quarterly updates. Um, which we do to talk about kind of all of our, our, our LMCR projects uh, are very high level, um, talking about project milestones, upcoming engagement, um, and other touchstones uh, that we want uh, you to be familiar with. Um, we also uh, bring with us uh, a lot of agency staff uh, across teams at EDC, uh, Parks, uh, Battery Park City Authority, uh, and I imagine uh, uh, we might have some of our friends at, at DOT and, and other agencies uh, with us as well. Uh, this is just one of our forums. Um, uh, and, you know, as I mentioned, updates tonight are, are fairly high level. Uh, we do have uh, workshops and uh, broader public meetings, have done walking tours, um, uh, and, and uh, try to engage uh, in every uh, possible way. And, and once again, we'll get to that at the end of our presentation as well. 
Uh, we last came to this committee, uh, I believe, in October. Uh, at that point, um, uh, we had just restarted uh, the FIDI Seaport project, uh, but the uh, Battery Wharf project was still paused. Um, I know that some of you know, but but maybe not everyone, uh, that that project has now been uh, unpaused and, and work uh, has restarted, and, and we'll get into that as well. Um, and, uh, you know, once again, uh, we'll end this evening uh, taking a look at, at what uh, is shaping up to be a very busy spring uh, across these projects, uh, you know, across BPCA's work, uh, across uh, Fid FIDI and Seaport, uh, as well as uh, uh, the Battery Wharf project. Um, and so with that, uh, we'll hand it off to uh, BPCA and I believe uh, Jenny, uh, take it from here. Hi guys, um, good to see everyone this evening. Uh, so um, we will actually be presenting in a little bit more detail on um, South Battery Park City in a, after this full LMCR update. Um, so, but very, very quickly, uh, the EIS, um, we have uh, moved from an EA to an EIS uh, and um, we will be looking at having a, uh, um, a public hearing um, and issuing the DIS, DEIS publicly during the summer. We'll talk a little bit more about that a bit later. Um, we have uh, a couple of big deadlines coming up. We have a 75% deadline for um, Pure Plaza and the battery section, and we'll be presenting a lot more on some of the design updates for that also after this. Uh, and then uh, the 95% for uh, Wagner Park, the pavilion, and the Museum of Jewish Heritage area. Um, uh, can we flip to the next slide? Um, great. All right. Uh, for the inner drainage area, um, we are actually in sort of uh, early concept development. I know that we presented to this group uh, at the beginning of last year on that. Um, so we are uh, looking to progress with that. We'll be coming back to, P uh, to CB1 with a separate meeting um, uh, within the next couple of months to, um, to show you some design updates in that area. Um, and that will be before going to PDC with that. That is a separate exercise from, from what we'll be talking to you about again also later on in this meeting. Um, and PDC uh, for the um, primary South Resiliency areas, which is Pure Plaza and the Battery, um, the right of way along Wagner Park and also um, in and around the first place area. Um, we will be submitting for final PDC submission in March um, and following up with the, um, the presentation in April. Uh, and obviously we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about South uh, a little bit later on in this meeting. So next. So North and West, I'm gonna hand across to Gwen. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome, Gwen. Great. Nice to be with everybody this um, this evening. Good to see all of you that I can see. Um, with respect to the the North and West Battery Park City Resiliency Project, um, as uh, we have previously reported, we um, have made a decision to combine the prior North BPC project and the impending West BPC project into a single combined um, progressive design build project. We are um, right now um, in the final stages of procuring a consulting engineer um, for that uh, project. And we expect that we will be um, coming, um, once we have that consulting engineer under contract, we will be coming to the community in the next couple of months um, for an introductory meeting um, about that project uh, that will have as its goal bringing on the progressive design build contractor in approximately a year from now. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions about it, but we are we are in the kind of initial inception of this new uh, combined progressive design build project and look forward to coming back to you with that uh, a little bit later. The, um, the ball field um, 
Resiliency Project. We are um, very excited about this because we are uh, really getting ready at this point to start construction. Uh, in the next few weeks, um, we have a contractor on board and we have um, um, things queued up to get started with construction um, around the end of um, March on this. So we anticipate we will have the ball field project um, constructed and in place with protection this summer. So that's um, really great news for everybody. Thanks. Great. Uh, and then, uh, and I'll oh, drop to, to Will, uh, Will Fisher at EDC to take us uh, to the Battery Wharf. Great, thank you, Jordan. Uh, good evening, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, uh, and happy new year to those of you who have been seen since last year. Um, I want to uh, just go back to something that Jordan mentioned earlier. Um, so in, uh, during the COVID situation, beginning in April, uh, a number of the capital projects that EDC had um, in our jurisdiction, including uh, the battery, including the 5 dice port master plan, including Brooklyn Bridge, Montgomery, Coastal Resilience, and CB3. Uh, were paused due to sort of you know, working with OMB to preserve the city's cash flow um, and the sort of reduced revenue scenario as well as in an emergency response scenario. So um, gradually throughout the fall, uh, we were you know getting the green light for these individual projects, uh, and we were able to uh, OMB and, and City Hall authorize us to proceed with this project uh, in December. So that was the the last of the LMCR projects to come off hold. Uh, so we're a little bit behind the schedule. We're still sort of working on what a master schedule will look like for the duration of this project. But uh, we are glad to be back to work on the entire LMCR portfolio. So with that said, uh, we reauthorized uh, Stantec, which is our design firm, uh, to uh, resume design work back in December. Uh, what we've really been focused on with that is um, generally doing an existing conditions analysis, uh, in working with our partner agencies, uh, particularly the um, Battery Park City Authority, the National Park Service, City Parks, and the Battery Conservancy. And actually, I'm already getting a little too into the weeds because I should uh, you know, <laughs> note that the project here is uh, generally, the, the extent of the project here is to uh, reconstruct the Battery Wharf uh, so, for I'm sure all of you uh, here in City One know this, but the wharf is not in great shape um, and it's uh, in need of uh, full replacement anyway. So, as part of the LMCR portfolio, we are uh, electing to uh, reconstruct the wharf at a higher elevation in order to protect against uh, in order to protect against sea level rise during the the useful life of that, which is about 80 years. Um, so back to where I was, I think generally we're looking to, uh, you know, move forward into design uh, more in depth this spring. Uh, because of that, um, you know, we are sort of, again, this is sort of uh, uh, the project that is the farthest behind because of the COVID delays, but we are going to be beginning the community outreach and engagement uh, coming up here very soon, which is great. Um, so while uh, this slide is the only update this evening, uh, we will be returning to this committee on March 15th um, for a uh, sort of in-depth update on the matter of what we're working on with that. Um, and we'll have the, uh, the design firm uh, in attendance there. So we're going to sort of introduce them and introduce the project in great detail in March. And then we're looking forward to having a, uh, an additional public meeting uh, sort of a, a standalone uh, as well in late March. Um, additionally, since we are trying to sort of keep this on track as best we can, um, although it is, it is clear now that we're not going to be able to start the construction for this project in, um, in 2021, as we originally anticipated, we are um, already moving th through the procurement process and working on finalizing a, um, a construction contract with Hunter Roberts Construction. Uh, so with that, that's the brief update there, and uh, I will turn to Kate Ward from EDC's Neighborhood Strategies team to run through the uh, Finance Support Master Plan. And we can obviously jump back to any of this for questions. Hey. Hey everyone, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, I'm Kate Ward. I'm with EDC's Neighborhood Strategies team I'm working on the FIDA Seaport Master Plan. Um, but I wanted to take a step back um, and make sure that in case there's any new folks joining us um, on this virtual um, community board meeting to, uh, to talk about what the FIDA Seaport Master Plan is doing. 
Um, so it is a part of this broader Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency Strategy. Um, I'm, sorry to, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but there is a great deal of background noise coming from somebody. If they can see, thank you. Sounds like it might have been cured. Sorry, Kate. No, that's okay. I always worry it's me. Um, so we have the obviously the Battery Park City project um, that Gwen and Jennifer presented on the Battery Coast Resilience, the Brooklyn Bridge and Montgomery Coast Resilience project. Um, but our project um, is really looking at the unique conditions of the Friday Seaport Master Plan and figuring out kind of the range of flood protection options that um, are necessary um, to protect this area. Um, so what are we trying to achieve by 2021? We're really trying to determine the extent of the potential shoreline extension, um, develop conceptual designs of coastal defense infrastructure and advanced first stage project options, create a roadmap that really details out what implementation would look like. So construction, government sort of taking it from start to finish, um, having conversations with our state and federal agencies to work out permitting strategy, um, and also create a drainage plan to uh, upgrade sewer systems in response to severe climate risks. Um, I think what we've learned through the other projects that are progressing is that, you know, this is a very old area and, and the sewer system is really going to need um, uh, a lot of um, upgrades to it in order to ensure that we're really being responsive to the impacts of climate risks. Um, so those are all the things that our team is working on. I'm going to go through um, a little bit on what we've been doing, our um, conversations with the regulators, um, a little bit more about our analysis into the different reaches and determining the sort of potential shrine extensions. And then finishing off with some of our exciting, awesome community engagement. I don't want to bury the lead, but we have a virtual open house on Thursday. Um, I really hope you guys can attend that. It's going to be a much deeper dive um, and really kind of go through everything that we've been doing this um, this past year. So, well, next slide. Um, so what have we been up to since we last met? So um, we have met with our Aquatic Resources Advisory Committee, ARAC. We love an acronym. Um, to discuss existing site conditions and project priorities. So this is a committee that has consisted of a lot of our, our state regulatory partners um, to help us really understand and, and better work through the regulatory process and a lot of the kind of like ecological and habitat um, information that we need to consider. Um, we've been progressing the aquatic sampling and testing in the East River. So we have a whole year sampling that we'll be doing and the first one was the fall. Um, so we got our fall samples um, and we shared it with the regulators and, and they're reviewing it. Um, we started our winter sampling as well. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on developing and refining hydrodynamic wave models. So this is including um, something called an advanced simulation um, ad crick and simulation waves near shore swan to understand the wave climate in the East River um, during both the storm and the non-storm conditions. Um, so really what this is telling us is like, what will the waves look like in all of our different years and all of our different conditions? So we can really determine what is necessary for a design fun elevation. Um, next, after that, we've also been doing a lot of tidal free analysis. So um, that actually is about understanding how sea level rise will impact all of our different maritime assets, including Whitehall Ferry Terminal and the Battery Maritime Building, as we better understand like what will be our different um, sea level elevations, um, this will start to tell when our assets are actually going to be vulnerable and may no longer be functioning kind of under their different um, operations. Um, we're also working very closely with DEP to build an additional detail and resolution into their existing New York City drainage model to really test different combinations of pumping and storage solutions to manage the stormwater in the study area. So a lot of really great, awesome, robust technical analysis. Um, next slide. Oh, no, back one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I did want to pause for a moment to take a second to talk about how the regulatory framework is informing how we design. Um, I think it's important to just set the scene that um, ultimately it will be the regulators that determine um, if it's necessary to go out into the water to build a shoreline extension. So they really um, establish the rules and regulations that we must comply with. I mean, they will be the ultimate decision makers if the project advances forward. And the framework that they set out for us as we do all of this analysis is we have to sort of follow three steps. The first is avoid. So our project team must fully assess if an online option is possible to implement based on technical feasibility, impacts, and cost. Then, if we found that there are certain areas of the study area where an online option is not possible, we have to minimize. 
So if we must go out into the water to site coastal resiliency infrastructure in certain portions, we must justify every inch and demonstrate that we are minimizing our impact. And then third, for every inch that we go out into the water, we must understand all potential impacts, including ecological navigation, scour, and demonstrate to the state and federal government that we're mitigating any of our negative impacts. So this is really when I talk to when I say that we're meeting with ARAC, they're really helping us understand this framework and the rules and regulations so that we're we're getting all that appropriate information like I talked about with our wave modeling, our habitat sampling, tidal frequency to really assess, you know, if we were to go out into the water, how much is necessary and what would mitigation maybe look like. So this, this is sort of the overarching framework, which we must comply with, and they will be the final decision makers on if a shoreline extension um, advances. Next step, next slide. Um, so I also wanted to pause and talk about the four different reaches. Um, so our study area kind of to the south in reach A, moving to the north in reach D. Um, so in reach A, this is your battery adjacent. You have a lot of key maritime um, uh, facilities here from the Whitehall Ferry Terminal to the Battery Maritime Building. Um, and it really is that transitioning period with the battery park. Then reach B, we call this our sort of financial district. Um, it's characterized by where the FDR transitions from an at grade um, section to a viaduct coming out of the Battery Park underpass. Um, reach C, this is our seaport district, which is really characterized by its historic assets and uses. You obviously also have um, the Pier 15, 16, 17, and with the tin building. And then reach D, this is really the Brooklyn Bridge adjacent and where our northern tieback is, so where we will connect back into higher ground. Um, and if some people are wondering what that blue line is, that's our 21, 2100-year uh, storm surge that we have to tie back into. So when we talk about kind of tying back in there, we're trying to sort of get to the, the blue line up there. So what our project team has been doing is really trying to understand what are the different conditions across all of these areas that uh, affect siting coastal infrastructure. So when we are studying what are constraints and opportunities, we really see the entire system, so from reach A to reach B, but understanding that there are very different conditions in each of these, and they will impact our, our, our the way that we site coastal infrastructure. So when we look at things, it's not going to be like a straight line. It's going to really kind of um, interface with all of these in a very different way. Um, so it's really important that we think of things from a system, but by specific reaches as well. So the next slide. So the way that we've been thinking about that is setting our analysis into three different buckets. So as we look at all these things, we really need to think about, um, you know, across each of these sub areas, what are on land options and different shoreline extensions from both the minimal into a wide to test them to understand how they meet the different project goals and priorities. So right now you're seeing them as, as a line. Like I said, as we go through this analysis, every different reach is going to influence where you might actually need to go out or stay on land in these different areas. So any alternative as we develop this with, um, with our analysis and with community, out, with community engagement is not going to be a straight line, but it's important for us as we start to develop what different options look like to kind of set bands so we can really test what are the different ways in which we can site coastal infrastructure, but also meet our project goals, which were, you know, keeping our maritime assets functioning, um, preserving both the quality and quantity of open space, you know, the existing historic conditions and historic character, siting drainage infrastructure, transportation. So all of these project options will likely include elements from all the different possible alignments with ranges of shoreline extensions, and there's no singular alignment option. But as we do this analysis, we're sort of citing things into different bands so that we can understand kind of like the different buckets and almost say, like, it's important to study everything to know what works and what doesn't work. Um, but when you see these lines, it's not to say that it's going to be a straight line. It's really just to sort of place things in buckets and it really will be, you know, include elements of all the different ones. It is very much not a uniform approach. We fully understand that it's a system, but each of the different sub areas has a lot of their own characteristics and goals that we'll need to meet. That's fine. Um, so um, a lot of this technical work is going to continue and we'll be evaluating some initial project options. 
So we're really transitioning from sort of confirming the solution space where we're developing urban design and placemaking and design principles. And that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about with the community on um, Thursday. Um, and that will really help to inform how we start to develop our initial on land and shoreline extension options for siting resiliency infrastructure. And, you know, on top of that, we have our habitat sampling, looking at different funding and financing options. So we've been doing a lot of work to just look at like what projects have hap like, happened around the country and how have they financed resiliency infrastructure and like what are the different ways projects in, in this country get financed. Um, we've also been doing more engagement. So I don't know if you saw, we launched our website. It's great. Please go check it out. You know, we have our public forum. We meet um, pretty right quarterly with the CCL, CCLM, the Climate Coalition for Lower Manhattan, and I obviously mentioned our ARAC meetings. Um, so we're really at this exciting moment where we can start to, um, to bring everything together and take all the information from the solution states and really start to develop some um, you know, um, options for siting resiliency infrastructure. Next slide. I also wanted to highlight that we're really trying to be um, as comprehensive as possible with our public engagement approach. So we really see the role of engagement as empowering our stakeholders by advancing the understanding of science of climate risks and the technical constraints and trade-offs of building flood protection in the study area. So we really wanna make sure that people fully understand the technical work that we're doing and the science behind what the climate risks are showing and the design flood elevation that we need to meet to protect lower Manhattan. So the kind of things that we're trying to do is areas of co-creation. So looking at ways to like work together, to develop project options that meet the needs and priorities, trying to delegate power to planning partners to help expand engagement. So um, we've done a lot of work with um, youth groups to sort of figure out um, how they can go out to their partners to figure out, oh, does anyone else lose the presentation? Um, I can probably do this off the top of my head if you're okay with that. Um, so I think it, you just probably Will's Will's computer probably fell asleep. He just needs oh, to get it back. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, Will, if you can, hear, um, he's just died. His computer's he's plugging his computer back in. Um, sorry, he says he'll be right back. Um, so no problem. <laughs> we're also trying to actively consult with individuals and organizations with stakes in the project to get feedback from them. And we're also obviously coordinating closely with our city agency partners, state partners, federal agencies to ensure that we're aligning on all of our alternatives in advance with feasible and implementable. So kind of what are different strategies and tools? So like I mentioned, we created this great new website, which really is an interactive portal in January. It has an ask the expert feature where you can send in questions. We've already started to get questions from folks and that's really exciting responding to them. Um, it also has maps where people can start to interact and talk about what they'd like to see, what their goals are, what their concerns are. Um, that's really awesome. Um, we've also um, been trying to do a lot of outreach for our upcoming virtual open house. So if you've walked along the, the, the section of our city area, you may have seen some of our banners. We've done um, some digital outreach as well. Um, so really trying to make sure that a broad um, group of people come to our public open houses. Um, we're also trying to host smaller subject specific meetings and workshops. So one thing that we heard from the climate coalition was that they really wanted to understand like a lot of our wave modeling and the, the hydro hydrological analysis. And so we had a coastal defense and ecology workshop to have brought in our technical advisors to, to talk the group through so they could fully understand the wave modeling that we were doing. Um, and uh, to sort of like actually, un you know, <laughs> even me, it was amazing to just hear of all the stuff that we're doing. Like I said, we're also working with a lot of youth groups. We've worked really closely with the Harbor School um, and sort of like engagement with um, their students. It was fantastic. Um, and we're always open to hearing of like different um, ways that we can engage with folks, um, obviously using our social media platforms. Um, but if there's a way that we can better reach out to people, we wanna make sure that we're doing that. Um, and so this, like Jordan said, this is gonna be a very busy spring, but we are excited to be in busy and uh, speaking with folks about this. Um, so that's, that's it uh, while we wait for, for Will's um, uh, slides to come up, I could maybe try to pull up the presentation. I'm not sure if I can override um, him. Kate, I'm gonna give you a presenter privileges. Okay, great. Um, yeah, that was that was incredible doing that from from memory. I think I would uh, fail at that task. Um, 
So yeah, I um, let me, I'm not super great at multitasking, but I'm pulling up the presentation right now. Um, I should have it up in probably 30 seconds. Perfect. Um, so uh, uh, I think we'll just leave you tonight uh, with a beautiful slide uh, when it arrives of our upcoming engagement. Um, as mentioned, and, and something that we've heard uh, uh, you know, throughout the, the community uh, uh, is a desire for, for engagement across uh, uh, different uh, uh, levels, obviously going into depth when necessary. Uh, tonight uh, is, is a session where we kind of talk about all of our projects. Um, but, uh, you know, we want to give the, uh, the opportunity to, uh, when, when the moment strikes to, to, to get, a, uh, uh, to add a little bit more context and, and, and go into depth, uh, on, on some of our projects. Um, so, uh, uh across the, the project area, um, uh, Battery Park City South, uh, as mentioned, uh, you know, update tonight and actually after this, uh, an opportunity to, to really, uh, dig in on and see some of their progress. Um, also later in the spring. Uh, they'll be coming back uh, to talk about some of their, their drainage work uh, and, and where that stands. Uh, for the North and West project, um, they will also be coming back in, in the spring uh, to do an introductory uh, project meeting uh, looking like April or so. Um, uh, mentioned uh, the battery earlier tonight uh, and will be coming back in, in March to this committee as well as uh, likely in April uh, to do a broader public meeting. For the FIDI Seaport project, um, we mentioned the open house that we're doing um, on Thursday. I know many of you were there last time when we were able to do it in person. Uh, we obviously can't do that now, uh, but we wanna bring some of that same creativity, uh, some of that uh, thinking out of the box and, and, and trying to engage in, in different ways uh, and, and, and do that virtually. Um, and so that's, that's happening this Thursday from four to eight. Um, we also have two workshops uh, uh, at least one uh, or potentially two happening in, in March. Uh, the first uh, envisioning a 21st century waterfront, really digging into our maritime assets, some of our transportation assets, um, and, and thinking about uh, what the waterfront means to us uh, uh, moving forward. Also, uh, we know that uh, uh, funding and financing uh, is, is uh, critical to the success uh, of, of this project, given its large ambitions, uh, and so have a, a session that we are planning for the end of that month. Uh, a fourth climate coalition meeting, uh, climate coalition of lower Manhattan, and uh, next open house uh, later in the spring. Um, I know uh, it is just outside the, the project area, but uh, 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 just outside of uh, community board one, uh, but uh, the Brooklyn Bridge Montgomery project, which we did not touch on tonight, um, also uh, moving forward very quickly. Uh, approaching final design, uh, going to uh, CB3 Waterfronts um, uh, Waterfront Committee in March and having a public meeting in April. Um, and as always, uh, uh, you know, coming uh, regularly uh, to this committee to talk about our overall strategy. Um, and so with that, uh, I think we will open it up uh, to questions if that's uh, still the plan, uh, Alice. Sounds like a good plan, Jordan. Thanks very much. So, first again, the committee members, uh, Colin Mahoney, welcome. Hey, how's it going? Hey, uh, sorry to sound like a broken record, but uh, I've asked this a number of times before, and I'll ask it again. If the uh, shoreline extension goes through, how will it be zoned? Um. Will or Elijah, you want to take a first first pass at that one, and then I can jump in. I'm sorry. What what was the question? How would it be what? How would it be? Let me cut to the chase. Will it be zone residential? Are we going to see a bunch of super falls on a proposed extended shoreline for downtown? Oh, land use will come after we've had conversations with you all about what you would all like to see in terms of programming and, and how the space actually functions itself. So there will need to be like land use itself will need to be addressed. Um, but I think what comes first is identifying what all of the priorities are and going through a process of, of really a, a comprehensive plan with the community. So 
Um, we don't have an answer yet on specifics with zoning. Um, we're 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 not close to that right now, but um, we'll be that'll be a part of all of the conversations around alternatives and project options. Yeah, I, and I appreciate that, but I think it's it's a fairly large part of that. <laughs> I mean, there's there's obviously a, a big push for green space downtown. We're currently mm -hmm. dealing with four or five super calls downtown. Uh, mm -hmm. The mayor's office in the past on these phone calls has declined to promise that there wouldn't be super calls on any extended shoreline. So mm -hmm. I would just urge you to make that a pretty large focus of what you do from now on. And I, yeah. I'm very pleased to hear that you would include the community board and, and the community as a whole, because I personally wouldn't want to approve or be in support of any shoreline extension that would include another 15, 70 story towers. Yeah, and, and that feedback's helpful. It, you know, we're talking to, we want to talk to a lot of people and, and hear what they want to see and what their vision is for the site. I think that's critical to having a shared, you know, city community vision for what this place is going to be. Is a mayor's office willing to commit to not put super tunnels or major residential areas in the shoreline extension downtown? Um, I, I mean, I, don't, I, I won't speak for the mayor's office, but I'll, I'll say that we're we're analyzing um, development as a means of potentially helping to pay for the project or even secure long term operations and maintenance of the site. Um, as as you know, and you know, as we've seen with other um, areas of new development, there's substantial kind of maintenance and management that's associated um, with with any new type of project or or infrastructure maintenance, and so. We're, we're invested in making sure that this project happens and that we have a clear plan for, for funding what needs to be paid for. So we're looking at development through that lens, which is um, from, a, from a financial viability lens, but then it feeds into um, really what this place is as well. So it's not, um, what's really driving our work is the coastal resilience piece. You know, We are gonna look at multiple funding sources that are not development, um, because what what we're trying to do is find a place to put this coastal infrastructure. Um, and, you know, we still have to figure out where the regulators are on development as well um, and what their appetite is for that. Um, we, we don't know that quite yet. So um, there might be a, a very specific response that we hear from um, the people who have and approved the design of this project as to how they feel about development. Um, and so those are all the things that we have to consider when we're developing options. So at this stage, what we're really doing is developing those options so that we know how to compare these different op these different trade-offs with each other. Um, and what we've committed to doing is leaving no stone unturned and 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 looking at everything. And I think that that's what the community has has really asked us to do. I understand, but it does sound like you have looked extensively at using residential development as a tool for funding the extension. So I just think that's, you need to be very that's clear one of that. the that's right. Yeah. And that is one of the things that we're we're looking at in terms of a potential funding tool. Um, yes. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Colin, we should be um, um, also sorry, everybody, my computer died during my presentation. Uh, uh, but yeah, Colin, so we have the um, like, you, you, like you can see here on the screen, we have the uh, a funding and financing workshop coming up in March. So um, that's an opportunity to talk more about the specifics of that work stream. Um, we're going to be distributing the information on, on how to get involved with that uh, through the community board. So hope to see you there. Yeah, I just think it's important that you be upfront and honest and transparent on all these options. Again, yeah, it, so, it, sounds so, like, it sounds like to, to, be, me, to, to, be, been, to be 100 percent honest questions about residential development to pay for it. Yeah, so Colin, we, we are we are looking at that. That is part of the scope of the study, just to be clear. <laughs> Thanks for being clear. Yep. Okay, thanks. Good question and response. Uh, Bob Steck. Okay, I I just want to at least meant I I always am, am kind of broad s s scale and uh, macro thinking about this, but these are things I've been thinking and worrying about for a long time. So these are the broadest gauge uh, concerns I have about coastal coastal resiliency that tonight's presentation in Toto uh, brought to mind. The first one is the Army Corps HAT study, which involves a potential barrier uh, in the harbor. And I think that that would, I think that there's been arguments about costs and how much, it, how much, it, how long it would take. 
but when we look at all these projects just in lower Manhattan uh, as as one area of cost and complexity, maybe revisiting the uh, harbor barrier is possible, and I'm not sure where the Army Corps hats uh, study is now. The next one is about the Northwest BPC resiliency project, and I've always been concerned that it stops and doesn't take care of Tribeca. And I think that something really should be in place at this level of macro thinking to protect Tribeca. And so, at least from my point of view, I don't understand what that is. And having something in place there, I think, is really important. And then the I think the idea of the 2100 flooding uh, for the financial district climate resiliency master plan is just seeing that blue line is something uh, really to worry about, but I'm not sure that building something into the uh, into the East River is the only way to overcome that. And my final question is, my final concern and question is, who decided, who was the decision maker in the current administration to go ahead with all of these uh, activities and how do they, how do we imaginably pay for them in the middle of the recovery from COVID that hasn't even started yet? Because we've really been a business zero, ground zero, at least in my experience downtown, and there's a lot that has to grow back here. So that's, those are my concerns. Thank, thanks for those, Bob. Uh, there's, there's a lot to unpack and I will probably uh, not uh, hit all of them, but I will try my best and, and hand off. Uh, uh, first one relates to the, the HATS study uh, for folks that, that are not familiar. That is uh, work led by the US Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, to study um, uh, protection options, uh, some of which, uh, as described, are kind of large gates uh, in the water. Uh, some are uh, a kind of protection inland. Um, you know, there's kind of a variety of different options. Um, that is work that was paused uh, during the uh, previous uh, 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 presidential uh, administration. Uh, the city is advocating uh, for that that work uh, to resume um, uh, and, and for funding to be allocated uh, from Army Corps headquarters uh, down to the district uh, uh, to, to get that started again. Um, and, you know, hopefully uh, uh, given uh, uh, kind of additional support for uh, climate initiatives, um, I, I think our prospects are, are looking better uh, and, and happy to, to update uh, uh, if and when uh, things resume there. Um, second question, uh, I believe, uh, was about the Northwest. Uh, was it BBC about area. Tribeca and, and a continuation of protection north of Battery Park City? Sure, so let me let me give that first to, to Gwen and then happy to, to support uh, um, any additional questions. Uh, thanks, Jordan, and thanks, Bob. Um, and I want to take the opportunity. I was kind of a little unaware earlier in the presentation, and I realized I didn't properly introduce myself. I'm Gwen Doss, and I'm the Vice President of Real Property for Battery Park City Authority. Uh, the uh, combined Northwest project and the northern portion of that project, as, uh, as we've discussed before, um, is intended to, um, as all of the Battery Park City projects are, um, to provide uh, risk reduction for uh, Battery Park City. Um, there are uh, instances, including in the South and the North, uh, where in order to do that, the uh, extent of the project um, and the project areas have to um, go beyond the Battery Park City um, boundaries proper. Um, in the instance of the North, in order to provide um, flood risk reduction for Battery Park City, the, um, the project area must extend across Route 9A um, over to approximately Greenwich Street in Tribeca. Now that um, extension will provide risk reduction not only for Battery Park City, but also for portions of Tribeca that are on the, the essentially the dry side of that boundary. Um, we are uh, fully cognizant 
um, that, that that does leave um, um, portions of Tribeca that unprotected. Uh, what we can, what we are uh, are intending to do, because it's not, we are not authorized to provide extended protection beyond that which is required for Battery Park City. We can't spend Battery Park City Authority funds um, for extended um, levels of protection. Um, however, we do um, want to coordinate with um, efforts um, at the city to provide a point at which then a, a further um, project or effort could take the end point of our project and extend it northward in order to provide uh, risk reduction for our greater sec uh, section or segments of uh, Tribeca. And I'll now turn it over to Jordan to discuss that further. What I would like to do is make an appeal that the city consider that. I completely understand that Battery Park City Authority is limited in its reach. What I'm saying is that the, the people that live in Tribeca and all the investments there have to be protected for the sake of the city and all those people. So we have to have a have a plan in place that's ready to to go to to protect that area. Yeah, Bob, then it's a, it's a great point stopped. and it's one we've been a song we've been singing for a while now. Jordan, can you speak to where the city is at with their plans for the Lower West Side? Yes. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, yeah, once again, this has been a, a topic at this community board for, for uh, a little bit of time. Um, as, as mentioned before, uh, the HAT study has uh, looked at uh, West Side protection. Once again, that work has paused. Uh, we, we want it to uh, to restart because you know there's a potentially viable option through some of that work. Um, uh, you know we have uh, uh, in the past also uh, started uh, uh, interim flood protection analysis. Unfortunately, uh, uh, there was a budget request uh, that was denied um, uh, to, to get that work uh, up and running again. Um, so you know I think we will continue to advocate uh, for for more attention there. Um, and, uh, you know, I, th I think the, the underlying point is, is a good one um, and uh, you know, don't have anything more th than that to say tonight. And, and, and you know, certainly uh, the community board has, has, has made this uh, priority uh, very clear. Um, so, I, you know, I would just like to uh, you have a nice public engagement calendar here. I would like this issue to be considered somehow in this public engagement. Okay. Um, so, I, I don't know. The, I know there are a few other questions you had, Bob. Um, you know, I may we'll, we'll try to attempt to answer them in in, in one fell swoop. Um, you know, I, I think you asked uh, who uh, made the decision to uh, advance uh, this strategy. That was the mayor. Um, I know many of you are familiar with the uh, uh, announcement uh, back in 2019 about this strategy. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a, a recommendation uh, across agencies uh, for these uh, approaches, both the, the on land capital projects and the, the study of the extension. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that work is, is uh, based on uh, uh, many years uh, of analysis and, and, you know, a lot of uh, which uh, this community board has, has, has seen very closely. Um, and, and and I think you had, you also had a, a question in there about uh, uh, the challenges uh, presented to the project uh, because of of COVID uh, and and economic uh, slowdown. I think that is uh, clearly the case, uh, and and you know something that 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 uh, we realized. Uh, it was not a, a challenge uh, that we anticipated uh, when 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 we started this work, uh, but we knew. Uh, that the uh, overall project cost uh, was likely to be large in the billions. And, and, and so with that in mind, um, and, you know, I think Elijah alluded to this, um, you know, wanted to, to make sure no stone was unturned in, in terms of uh, our approach at looking at, at federal, state, uh, you know, additional local uh, taxes and, and other surcharges. And, and so that is kind of a conversation we hope to have uh, with you all in, in March. Uh, uh, real estate uh, and, 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 and potential development has always been on the table. We've been clear with the community board uh, since the outset that, that, that it's critical uh, for us to look at that, uh, given that 
you know, we want a project to move forward and doing the analysis uh, to tell us whether that's a viable option, uh, it, you know, is, is critical and another tool in our, in our toolkit. You know, I think the other thing that has obviously changed uh, is the, uh, uh, you know, the federal administration and, and um, uh, some of the support of climate po policies and programs. Once again, that was uh, 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 kind of a different, uh, different administration when this project started, but I, I think, you know, we are, are much more, uh, uh, you know, I believe there's a, a better opportunity for us uh, 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 given the, the current administration. So I think I, I got to almost all of your, your questions, uh, but uh, I just I, want to close out with okay, one, Bob, we're going to have to let one us. final statement that's important. And that is that a lot of these things are very long term projects. But what we what having lived through Sandy, what we need is what what could happen in the next two to three or four years rather than in the next 15 if if we encounter a second Sandy or worse. Well, yeah, I guess just, just quickly, you that's know, my case. <laughs> To, to that point, that's why our strategy has interim flood protection measures that are, that are already on the ground. We have capital projects that are moving forward uh, 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 this year uh, and, and, and into 2022. Uh, and we have the long-term planning uh, that is necessary given the, the scale of these challenges. So we're, we're, we're thinking now uh, and we're, we're moving now and, and thinking into the future. Thanks. Great questions, Bob. And thanks, Jordan. Great answers. I do want to just follow up on the point of the West side. I think at this point, rather than have yet another year go by where we're singing the same song, um, would it be possible that you, through the powers of the mayor's office of resiliency, be able to form some sort of meeting inviting Army Corps, the state DOT, and yourselves to kind of come to the table and talk about solutions that are being considered in really ways that we could or couldn't go forward. So we have players that are pr pretty much, you know, critical parts to this. You know, the idea, I know that that whole West Side uh, is, you know, Route 9 has got the whole state DOT involved. And we always told this, but we never get to sort of engage with them about, well, is there anything that we can do? You know, uh, it just seems like to fold it over to the Army Corps all the time when that's not happening. And it didn't, you know, I think there was a sort of 10 year plan ahead at minimum. You know, I just think we, we probably need to work a little harder. And so I'm just wondering if we could arrange some kind of meeting on behalf of the community on that, like I've described. Sure. L let me follow up with you offline, but I think that's a reasonable okay. request. Okay, great. All right. Let, next up, Michael Kramer. Okay, my question is about um, the avoidance, the, the avoiding uh, portion of this, the on land solutions. And I'm wondering if we could have a full disclosure of all the efforts you're making uh, in the Thursday meeting to talk about that. And specifically, reach C. Sure, sure. so uh, give this uh, cater. Yeah, I, can, I can take this. Um, yeah, so, so Michael, uh, good evening. And I realized that um, I, we answered, I answered a question of yours over email, but not the second one. So uh, seeing you tonight is reminding you to do that. So it's, it's nice to see you. Yeah, so the, um, the, the, interactive open, the interactive open house on, on Thursday um, is going to be an opportunity to uh, generally the format. I don't know if you were able to make your, the, the one last year, but generally we tried to do sort of a, um, um, as Rob from the Harbor School described it, choose your own adventure. Uh, but generally, there's going to be um, sort of multiple individual modules, and you can attend as many or as few as you'd like uh, within the within the time period. So it's from four to eight p.m. on Thursday. Um, but yeah, so in that uh, we'll have some discussion of the you know plenty of discussion of the existing conditions on land, um, other things like hydrodynamics, um, marine ecology, et cetera. So I think the the sort of brunt of your question um, <clears throat> talking about sort of why it's so difficult to build on land. Uh, we definitely have. Plenty of robust discussion about. I think, you know, like we've talked about before, it sort of comes down to um, very. Uh, it comes down to sort of narrow width of land that we have to work with. There's the FDR overhead. There's the subway tunnels underneath. Uh, obviously, the buildings in the seaport are, um, you know, uh, hundreds of years old and have, you know, it, it's difficult to do a building by building approach or even a block by block approach. So. That's generally what we're looking at, but um, we, we will definitely be prepared to discuss that in detail uh, on Thursday. Hope to see you there. I, I will be there, but if it's not in detail, would you come to a community board meeting and have that conversation? 
Sure, of course. I think that's one of the most important parts of this project here. And and um, as Kate noted as well, you know, um, there's uh, a robust amount of you know regulatory framework in place at the city, state, and federal levels. You know, um, it, it's you couldn't just build out into the water just because you feel like it or just because you want to. So we we definitely need to prove that it is. Um, you know, a necessity in order to reach, achieve the resilience goals that we have for the neighborhood to uh, build into the water. So we, we will have to do that from a regulatory perspective, but obviously we want to have that conversation with the community as well. Okay, let, let me help board four help you, board one, excuse me, help you with the uh, on land uh, possibilities. Okay. okay. Um, you know, we'll, while we have um, did this sort of all star cast from the EDC, can you just spend a moment summarizing what money of the $100 million that I guess Catherine McVeigh used so, you know, wonderfully got for this part of our um, community on, on, the, on these issues? Where is that money now? Can you just sort of, I, I'm delighted to show you're coming in next month to give the sort of whole funding and financing, but what has been spent and, you know, what, what sort of like, what happened to the rebuild by design money? Is that the same as a hundred million? Where are we at? Can you just get like a little, you know, yeah, yeah, data of course. Um, Kate, would you mind going back to the, to the project overview map, please? Uh, generally, Alice, um, BMR, which is the project in community board three. Um, it's funded by a by a federal grant, HUD grant, um, and some city capital money. Um, the battery coastal resilience, the the wharf reconstruction at the sea level height, is um, is also funded by city capital. And I believe Jordan and Elijah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the hundred million that you noted, Alice. Uh, That's right. For that project, uh, because we had sort of an existing pot of money to repair that wharf. Um, as is, and we are, you know, investing additional money to, uh, you know, raise that and use that as a flood protection feature. I, I couldn't quite hear you exactly, but if you don't mind, at some point, could you just put sort of do a little document for us? To yeah, keep, sure. Yeah, you know, and with the specific numbers, I think that would help us all because we're always wondering. Sure, of course. <laughs> where I think where it's all going. The, okay, the short answer. The short answer is that the capital projects that we have discussed here, Battery Park City, uh, the Battery. Wharf and the Brooklyn Bridge Montgomery are are generally funded, and then the five IC port master plan. We have um, the uh, we have the the consultant contract for the study is is fully funded, but the project thereafter is not. But yeah, I'll send, you, I'll send the community board an, an email sort of with a breakdown of all that. Oh, that's great. So we've got Tammy Belzer. Hi, Tammy. Tammy, are you there? I am. Sorry about that. Hi, Tammy. Uh, apologies. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for the presentation. I want to know if you could spend a couple minutes um, explaining a few things because the community heard a lot about the zoning for coastal flood resiliency and the follow up that we have from the office there, which seemed to be um, less concerned with the amount of flooding that CB1 would endure as compared to the presentations that we see in front of us today from where you are. I've asked this before, so I'm wondering, um, they talked an awful lot about the new zoning and how it would affect the infrastructure in terms of the urban lands. In their estimation, they said, you know, for 2050 that there was no daily tidal flooding that you know the primary flood risk that we had through 2050 was coastal storm surge only during severe storms mm -hmm. this seems to be very different um, in terms of the modeling and things like that so i just want to understand because when you're talking about not only the on land, but the extensions, that is an absolute major supposition to be going through. I want to make sure that I, you know, yeah, all of course, of course. Same, same. Right. So, so um, Kate, would you mind going back to the slide showing um, the three sort of bands along the 5A seaport area? So, um, or actually, go one back if you wouldn't mind. I'm just looking for where the that flood line is best visible. So, the team can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Tammy, it's, it's, it's a good point you make. Um, 
we are we are working from the same data set um, and the same sort of analysis that was done by the uh, New York City panel on climate change, but we're just working with different figures from within that. So what city planning is looking at um, is the the 20, like you said, the 2050 sea level rise metrics. Generally, um, and I've spoken with Allison Brown um, quite a bit about this, is generally they are looking at um, you know, for the purpose of, um, you know, sort of helping property owners make resiliency retrofits to their individual buildings. They're looking at the, the, the life of a 30 year mortgage. So they're looking at, um, you know, sea level rise out to 2050 and they're just looking specifically at, at zoning lots. Um, so the, uh, I believe uh, what you're noting about sort of less impact um, is specifically talking about the upland building zoning lots because of sea level rise. But, um, you know, of course, we're also looking at the uh, all the peer infrastructure, um, you know, making sure that the Esplanade is still usable, making sure that the uh, Whitehall terminal is still usable, the subway tunnels don't flood, et cetera. So, whereas city planning and that analysis from the same data set and from the same analysis is looking at 50, uh, 2050s sea level rise, uh, we are looking at, um, and this line here represents the uh, anticipated 2100s uh, storm surge. So this is what a 100-year storm in the year 2100 would look like. So uh, whereas, whereas city planning is looking at the sea level rise for sort of the nearer term in 2050, um, you know, with a project of this magnitude, we have the opportunity to study a sort of longer time horizon. Um, so we're looking at the 2100 for that. And I think it's important, you know, to sort of have uh, interventions that city planning is considering, as well as sort of larger infrastructure like this to sort of have some kind of redundancy in place. Yeah, and and I appreciate that. I think one of my concerns and questions is much like we worked with the Battery Park City Authority when we talk about quote redundancy, there is a cost factor that's involved with that. So, for example, if you use that as a modeling, they were able to reduce the cost for the ball fields to a major extent because there would be supplemental provisions and protections provided by their Northern Battery Park City plan. And while I appreciate the thought that uh, the zoning for coastal flood resiliency was deemed for upland properties it, the in the analysis and the dialogue that they had they very specifically was not necessarily about upland it was about front street and south street and all the ones that are in the zones that we're talking about so i don't i just want to ensure that we get the most robust protection that we possibly can with the least amount of disturbance to the ecology and that that mm -hmm. really should be the goal that we're looking at because if we've enabled buildings to provide resiliency through financial incentives all along the way and that is done then are what we will parts of these this project be completely redundant and therefore a waste of taxpayer money? Yes, yeah, so those I are think, questions that we need to think about. Yeah, so, so I think for the, um, uh, just to be clear on the upland part. So when I say upland, I think generally what I'm thinking of is the difference between the, the piers and the in-water assets like Pier 11, the heliport, Whitehall terminal. Um, and, you know, there is, uh, there are sort of, uh, you know, openings into the subway infrastructure down there. So, you know, buildings on Front Street and South Street, um, I don't mean to exclude those. I think there is a, uh, you know, potential impact there. I, I, I would also say that, you know, if there are building level retrofits done uh, by a large, you know, 50 or 60 story building on Front Street by a, you know, a sort of commercial real estate property owner, that's one thing. And maybe they can move their critical facilities to the roof or up off of the ground floor um, so that in, in the 2050s, um, you know, they don't have an impact from sea level rise, but if a sandy like storm were to happen again in the 2050s, um, you know, the subway infrastructure would be flooded again, Whitehall terminal would be flooded again. A lot of those buildings in the seaport that you just, because of their age and the condition, you just can't retrofit to be, um, you know, completely flood tight. A lot here that well, isn't, that falls outside of what you're able to do through zoning for coastal resiliency. How does, I mean, I hear that. I'm curious how it interacts with the presentations that you had from the MTA, um, specifically about the doors they're putting on the underpasses and the tunnels and the subway closures that they showed us that would protect those stations. So 
again, looking at the best ways that we can maximize plans that have been put in place so we don't overshoot to be fully redundant and find we've, you know, solved our coastal issues by building tall towers and duplicated our efforts in places that we might not necessarily need to. I'm exceedingly concerned about the small building, but, you know, yeah. in REACH A, there's been a lot of work done on resiliency in that area, and I haven't seen it yet represented in the diagrams and discussions we've had. Mm -hmm. I, I would say, um, like, uh, the for REACH A, I think the biggest example is, is Whitehall Terminal is still uh, very much at risk from a, a Sandy Luck event. Um, especially the farther you get into the century, but um, Kate or Elijah or Jordan, would you mind? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, with the, the, overlap with the MTA or the discussions we've had with them, the coordination is ongoing. Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that. So we um, sort of a few things. So we we have been engaging with them to better understand what is their uh, what is what of their assets are vulnerable to both sea level rise and storm surge. So. They have done a lot of work to deal with um, storm surge and kind of like the 35 year like asset life cycle. So um, they have done a lot of work and it's probably what they presented to you on to ensure that their assets are protected in kind of like their own life cycle. But looking to like the 100 years, um, everything that they put in place um, will need to be <clears throat> for their stations and for some of their key assets. Would need to be re would need to be replaced when it reaches the end of its life cycle, and so we are in close coordination with them to determine that if this project was to move forward, um, where is there actually a cost saving because we install our infrastructure and that they no longer have to go in and repair and replace something every twenty to thirty years. Um, in addition to that, there is a lot of their infrastructure that is really hard to protect, like drainage and gates um, that just are rely on deployables um, where actually you're flooding their tunnels and their subsurface infrastructure that is not closely related to their station footprints. Um, so we are looking in a deeper dive analysis with them to determine given the where we would likely where we could potentially site coastal infrastructure and elevating your shoreline and dealing with all of the drainage because right now they actually also see a lot of backup due to due to drainage of flooding. Um, that we would no longer be, their tunnels would no longer be flooding and you'd actually see a lot of um, <clears throat> uh, positives for their infrastructure. Um, so we're in a close coordination with them, but it, they're actually doing a fantastic job for the sort of 20 to 30 year time horizon. They've done a lot to protect their assets. We're just now thinking through, you know, at that 30 year time horizon, when you have to come back in and do it all over again, what might there be a, a, a synchronization with our project and their infrastructure work? Um, and then I would just also add to sort of one of the things that's that's come up a lot is um, we're also really looking at sort of the questions of the on land. There, there are many places we're looking at all of this of like um, citing the infrastructure within a building. We're also, you know, we're looking at all that across the study area. It's going to be something that we talk through people with at the workshop on Thursday is explaining what all the different on land options are because we want people to understand that and what are some of the 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 challenges with those. So a lot with the online option, if you're looking at citing it in a building's footprint, like Will said, you would not be protecting any of your infrastructure on the water side of that. So in the, you know, you see by the year 2080 or 2100, you'll have about four to five feet of sea level rise. And so you'll be seeing daily inundation with tides. So you no longer have, um, you will no longer really be able to walk on the Esplanade or access any of the pier buildings. They'd no longer become functioning. Your Whitehall Ferry Terminal, which serves, you know, thousands of people a day, couldn't function. Um, and so we have to sort of figure out where are those opportunities where you can site something on land, but also figure out ways to protect our um, our assets. And so that's that's going to be the big thing that we talk people through of um, the on land options. Thanks. Do, I just follow up on that. Is um, are you looking at the water retention storage sorts of situations, much like at Hoboken Park? I mean, is that something that's uh, very much on your radar, or even working with developers on building sites that might have a potential for you know water retention? For example, 250 Water Street, which has been brought up. I, I'm just curious, you know, where that's going, if anywhere. Yeah, we've had a lot of conversations with DEP. Like I, like I said, drainage is going to be 
is a real challenge um, for all of Lower Manhattan. And so we've been having a lot of conversations with DEP about what is their preferred approach for a drainage strategy, whether it's localized to this study area or sort of more broadly. The big thing we heard from them is they don't want to rely on storage alone. Um, they've had a lot of challenges um, with like maintenance and operations of storage tanks. Um, but we we are, it is something that we are looking at and we think it could definitely be applicable. Um, we're just sort of looking at both a storage and a, and pumping scenarios as it relates to drainage. Thanks. Sorry if you already no. answered that earlier. No, no, no. Alice, I think just really quick on that, since I think that's come a few times, is that you know, in, in thinking about the risks that risks that we are protecting against, there's the there's um daily tidal inundation from sea level rise, which is something that of course the um you know the the tide gates way out in the harbor that, that Bob mentioned earlier from the Army Corps study um, can't 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 deal with. Um, so there's there's the daily sea level rise, tidal inundation, there's storm surge, and then to to the point that you just made, there's sort of during a storm event, there is water falling on land that needs to you know flow somewhere. So um, the I, I did ask our, our engineering team to look into the the resiliency park in Hoboken. I, I know that's come up a few times, um, and generally it sounds like that project is designed more or less to absorb rainfall during a storm. Um, and uh, I'm not sure of the the kind of volume they expect it to. Of course, we have a very large project area here, um, so I think you know sort of uh, also to our conversation the other day about about the Water Street uh, construction that uh, several of the cities doing. You know, there, there's only so much you can do with sort of permeable pavers and surfaces, but you know that is of course something we're looking at. But you know, when we're looking at a project area of this size, uh, we really are looking into you know pump station infrastructure, retention infrastructure, et cetera. Um, we do hope to have more info on that uh, kind of in the coming phases. God, I'm glad you're looking at Hoboken. It's a really interesting project and certainly a multi-tiered approach. Obviously, it will come to pass. I'm sure. Thanks. Um, Last question is from Tommy Loeb from the community. Tommy, are you there still? There you go. Yes, thank, thank you. Um, I live up upriver a little on the Lower East Side and we're confronting side coastal resiliency project. And I'm wondering, uh, people might not realize, but we've had a hard time getting hand, our hands on documents that supported the current plan. Um, and we've had to use the freedom of information and we just got hundreds of pages of redacted information, which talked about the advantages and disadvantages of the current plan. And I feel listening to this conversation, I think that the city is going into this plan with a uh, possible bias for development. And I'm wondering if you're going to, if you will make a commitment to board one that all documents all planning documents, all consultants' names will be made public and that those documents not be redacted in any way so the community cannot get the advantage of seeing what the advantages and disadvantages of any alternatives that you might be proposing. So I, I, I can jump in here and then will uh, others please please do as well. Um, you know, I think we have been uh, uh, discussing this project with with the community for the better part of a, a decade at, at this point. Um, you know, I think we have been uh, uh, kind of as as clear and consistent on our messaging, uh, not wanting to, to get ahead and and, and ultimately to, to let the the data and, and the kind of understanding of of the, the risks lead this work. Um, you know, as as mentioned before. Um, you know, we, through our, our, our previous uh, study, came to the conclusion that on land uh, was infeasible, challenging, and then and we're, we're, we'll be showing some of that um, in the coming weeks and months of, uh, you know, what challenges that presents. Um, to the, to the, the specific question on um, sharing documents, we have consistently done that with the community board. You know, I think there are, are, are moments where there are consultant deliverables uh, that you know come to us, and, and it is our job to evaluate uh, what we can stand behind. And so I think in in those moments, uh, you know, historically, uh, cities have not released um, you know uh, consultant work that hasn't been been fully vetted. And so I think those are the moments where where you can't release the the full document. But um, you know, I think we're we're committed to transparency. We have been. Uh, we will be uh, moving forward. Um, so. 
you know, ha happy to honor that request. That's great to hear and a great place to maybe move on. I'm concerned that we have, if I'm not mistaken, we have the Battery Park City Authority doing a presentation in more detail of Wagner Park. Um, is that happening still <laughs> before we all go to bed? Okay. Well, um, any last comments for Jordan and Will? Uh, I mean, I, I assume you're going to be here, obviously, for this next presentation. So maybe we just keep moving ahead. Is that okay with all? Um, great. So, um, okay, well, I guess, is it, I guess, Gwen, are you going to be um, presenting this? And thanks very much to Will and Jordan and Kate. And all. Thank you as well. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Very helpful and Thank great you. to have the opportunity to hear from you. Hi, Gwen. Hi, Alice. Thanks. Um, I'll start it off. Um, I think Hogan um, Edelberg is going to be the presenter. I'm going to turn it over quickly to the folks at AECOM to walk through the presentation. But um, I just wanted to take the opportunity as soon as we put up the presentation, just to very quickly um, run through where we are in the process. Again, I know that Jenny mentioned that earlier, and I don't want to I don't want to belabor that. But we are at a point um, where, for Wagner Park, we are. Um, we are uh, about at 95% uh, design, and we have uh, done a lot of work since the last time um, the presentation was made to um, the, the the committee, um, and we've taken um, a lot of the comments and concerns that were expressed by the committee and, and responded to them. Then I'm going to get let uh, Acom get to that. Uh, without delay, but we will uh, be looking to go to uh, make another presentation, a final presentation to um, the PDC in April, the hearing in May um, for um, both the, uh, the Wagner Park area, uh, Museum of Jewish Heritage, um, which is at 95%, and then for um, the PRA Plaza and Battery, which is now at about 75% design. Um, and we'll start looking at um, issuing uh, design packages um, for construction for the, um, for the Wagner Park and Museum of Jewish Heritage segments in June with the, uh, with the intention of, of beginning construction uh, around um, November of this year. Um, and for the EIS, um, as Jenny mentioned, we are uh, in the scoping process for the EIS, and um, we'll be looking at um, a uh, draft EIS in the middle of the summer, um, and a hearing on that, um, and a final EIS around um, the end of October of this year. So, just just in terms of setting the the, the context for time, just wanted to get that out of the way, and now I'm going to turned it right over to ACOM to get into the meat of the presentation. Thank you, Gwen. Um, and with that, I'll scroll through. I think I, <clears throat> we've gone over the, the schedule. Jenny, uh, if you want to uh, give a quick update here before we move into sustainability and site salvage. Um, if not, I can keep moving. Keep, keep going. Okay, going. Yeah. great. Um, and I think we, I think we just talked through most of this um, as well. So, we can skip right. so we're going to get into a little bit more detail here. Um, and Gwen, do you want to speak to this slide? Uh, this we, we, I just, I just talked through that too. I, I, I did it without the benefit of the, the slide. So you can just go on to the next. Even better. Great. Um, so with that, I'll invite, um, Ben Shepard from Atelier 10, um, who's on our team for sustainability, um, to kick off this uh, section. Thanks, Hogan. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent, excellent. Um, well, uh, hi, everybody. I'm Ben Shepard. I'm a director with Atelier 10, uh, and we are here to update um, the community board uh, this evening on uh, the project's sustainability efforts to date. Uh, again, sustainability really uh, at the heart of the project and specifically focused on a number of key areas, uh, those being uh, resilient site and landscape, uh, much of which you've already heard about at a macro scale, but we'll be getting a little bit more in depth here, uh, as well as, as the pavilion building itself. 
and implementing uh, a very ambitious zero carbon approach. Um, and I'll be talking through that. Um, I just wanted to highlight some of the strategies um, that you see here, both the site and the building level. Um, certainly resiliency again, and the stormwater management aspects, uh, but also the native plantings, uh, the enhanced habitat support, um, uh, solar lighting and low carbon concrete and materials, which we'll be getting into more details about. Um, that's really on the site side. On the building side too, um, thinking about uh, a bird collision deterrence and avoidance, um, rooftop renewable strategy, uh, triple pane glazing and envelope, high performance envelope approach um, and other low carbon strategies, which we'll get into detail here. Uh, next slide. Hope. So, to ensure the project meets its sustainability goals and in alignment with the uh, important project program that we have and the drivers that we see on site, we're pursuing not one, but actually two sustainability certifications, uh, external certifications. Uh, for the site, and you see here overall, uh, it's the wedge waterfront alliance um, uh, system, and uh, that is in line with uh, again many of the resilience goals that we have for the project, the ecology, uh, accessibility, and other other design goals. Uh, that again for the site overall, uh, for the pavilion building itself, uh, we're pursuing the uh, International Living Futures or ILFI uh, abbreviated zero carbon standard. Um, this is a, a standard that represents a, a really a deep and meaningful assessment of a building's carbon footprint, and I'll explain exactly uh, why uh, we've gone that route and the details uh, with that. Um, it's important to state that both of these certifications uh, really align with uh, BPCA's sustainability plan um, and that the lessons uh, that are learned as, as far as uh, these certifications are also being uh, applied elsewhere within Better Park City uh, to the project site and, and projects uh, as appropriate. Uh, next, please. So I wanted to start by talking about the ILFI Zero Carbon. Um, and it's a performance-based standard, uh, which is important. So it's not based on just as designed, but actually as performing. Um, and it's a carbon standard that applies to both operational as well as embodied carbon. Uh, what do what does that mean? Uh, operational carbon or energy use, energy consumption is, is what most sustainability certifications focus on. Um, and, and the reason for that is addressing operational emissions, um, aligning with energy efficiency, um, um, and, and that's something that's a, a key part of this program. Um, it also relates to having an all electric building. Uh, so no combustion of fossil fuels on site, uh, no burning of natural gas. Uh, uh, is, is a key part of that. Um, there are minimum EUI reductions, energy use intensity reductions uh, as well from an operational perspective, and we'll also be offsite, uh, offsetting um, all energy uh, still consumed on site with both uh, on site renewables as well as off site. Um, and again, that's uh, important in encapsulating the operational portion uh, of the approach. Uh, the big difference here from a lot of systems is the embodied carbon piece. Um, now, what is embodied carbon? Uh, embodied carbon is the, the emissions that are associated with um, the structure, the foundation, the materials that go into a project, um, and everything that's also uh, in its extraction, uh, its transportation to the site, um, everything that, that's going into that. And so, um, we are pursuing both of these aspects, both from an operational perspective and reduction and the embodied. And you see some of the embodied carbon um, components here, foundation, structure, enclosure, finishes, um, et cetera. Um, next slide. So with the embodied carbon approach, um, again, this involves the, the harvesting, the mining, the creation of materials, um, everything that's going then into the long life of the building. And that's important from a carbon perspective because these are the decisions, the choices made now that will impact uh, not just uh, the immediate construction uh, in operation terms, but operation of the long term. So how much emissions is associated with that? Um, and, and with the team, we've been conducting and completing a whole building life cycle assessment um, where basically we go in and uh, before a single product is chosen, um, uh, are able to determine what the relative impacts of that material might be uh, based on the project specifications and um, finding other 
um, uh, applications or other um, um, supplemental um, um, strategies that we can do. So substitutions, for instance. So you see a few key strategies here that we're looking at, cement replacement for concrete applications, um, looking at low carbon uh, concrete technologies, uh, high recycled content in steel and rebar um, and other uh, metal fabrications, uh, low impact insulation substitutions, and even to the interior finishes. So from the macro to the micro. Um, and the, the graph you see here is an estimate, uh, and this is from our whole building life cycle assessment of a baseline building without any of these improvements done to a proposed design that's showing a 37% improvement in these embodied carbon uh, emissions associated. And you can see too, for the colors, uh, interiors, enclosure, structure, foundation, et cetera, where those gains can be achieved. Uh, next slide. So there's a lot going on uh, with the integrated approach to sustainability for the pavilion building, uh, the systems in sight, uh, interactions that you see happening here. Um, again, uh, uses from the, the building and design perspective, as well as the systems themselves and uh, keeping a holistic approach uh, in minimizing the uh, environmental impact of the building from both an operational and an embodied uh, perspective. Next. Um, finally, I wanted to touch on the wedge certification again, moving from the, the pavilion building now to the site. Um, we are pursuing the uh, wedge certification, uh, which is administered by the Waterfront Alliance and is specific to waterfront projects. And it addresses a wide variety of strategies um, understanding that all waterfronts aren't the same, uh, but have an opportunity to address coastal resilience, ecology, um, public accessibility in a variety of ways. Um, and here you see some of the key strategies, uh, both from a process standpoint and assessment and planning that have happened to date, uh, as well as with what the project is doing from a resilience, from a community accessibility perspective and habitat, ecology, um, and other natural resource perspectives. So with uh, the use of these two sustainability certifications, uh, we can really have a holistic approach uh, that not only guides the, the team, but uh, shows, um, uh, shows the, the real achievement at the end of the day. Next. I think I'm handing off now. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Ben. Um, and we want to touch on um, the team and the, the project approach to site salvage overall as part of the larger sustainability story. Um, so what this slide is showing us now is the areas um, that we're studying to reuse salvaged materials from the existing site um, within um, the proposed project, both in Wagner Park, as you can see on the left, but also in areas through Peoria Plaza in the center and the battery on the right. Um, the overall goal um, besides salvage for um, the South Battery Park City project is to maximize salvage for what can be reused throughout Battery Park City Authority. Um, but specifically on this project, we've been working with our design partners, including um, SiteWorks Landscape Architecture, um, to see what is out there on site today, um, create a catalog of these elements that you see listed on top here, including the tapestry stone, jet mist, Stony Creek granite, the uh, EPA wood that's existing, and some of the trench drains and then locate areas um, where it's appropriate to reuse that stone um, as part of the new construction. Um, and so this just gives you an overview of that approach. Um, we're looking at kind of a range of options um, for reuse of the stone, both into some of the site walls that are integrated, um, the low site walls that are integrated along uh, Battery Place, um, potential new installations of that stone within Wagner Park itself, um, as well as the Museum of Jewish Heritage, uh, replacing the Stony Creek granite um, blocks that are out there today on the northern edge of the battery berm um, and looking at reusing EPA wood um, in some of the benches and trench drains where appropriate um, at the base of the allays here shown um, in number four. Um, so I know um, we're, we're running late and I appreciate everyone staying on. There's a number of things to go through today and I'll, I'll try to get through, through them pretty quickly. Um, the first uh, section we want to discuss with the, the community today is uh, Peoria Plaza site security um, and, um, and the condition along battery place. Um, and what we're looking at today, we're going to look at, it, look at an update um, to the northern edge of Peoria Plaza um, and our design response to integrate um, site security measures, physical site security measures into that northern edge 
um, and how we can use uh, that site security uh, to, in concert with our wayfinding approach um, and site materiality to create a really unified site condition along uh, Battery Place. So as part of this design study, we took an opportunity to zoom back out and look at the function of Peria Plaza um, in context. Um, and it's really a central destination between Wagner Park, the Battery, um, the Puree Building, um, and the Hudson River Greenway. Um, and it really connects all of these four elements. Along with that, some of the original design principles that we established at the beginning of this phase um, are to maintain views um, north to One World Trade, south to the Hudson River, both in the north and south of the Puree Building. Um, to unify that street edge, um, creating a sense of continuity um, from Wagner Park through PRA and even into the battery. Um, and that can be done also by extending some of the canopy cover into Perry Plaza um, to help uh, with shade cover um, to sort of maximize the, the coverage, um, especially in this area, keeping in mind that we want to keep uh, some space open for views. Um, and then where possible, connect and strengthen the relationship with um, Park's edges, uh, both Wagner Park to the north um, and the Battery to the south. The physical site security elements um, that we're integrating into Peary Plaza um, consist of uh, four types, um, all which need to create a continuous barrier um, for vehicular security along the edge of the plaza. Um, so you can see here zoomed out sort of what this footprint starts to look like, and I'll walk through in a little bit more detail how that um, becomes integrated into the site um, as we zoom in. Um, but sort of the basic components that we need to understand are either a 40 inch uh, knee wall um, that can be integrated into the landscape. And we have an opportunity in this case to leverage the grade change that we already have uh, between the top of Perry Plaza um, at elevation 11 and the street, which is between elevation 7 and 9, um, to integrate those 40 inches with as minimal uh, disturbance as possible. Um, along battery place, um, we can use the landscape berm um, that we have um, helping to mitigate um, the effect of the grade change here uh, as part of the site security measures. And then where we want to provide access, we use a system of either fixed or operable bollards um, to allow pedestrian um, and bicycle access. Um, keeping in mind that this all needs to work seamlessly uh, with the circulation and wayfinding strategy. Um, so this diagram is, um, there's a lot going on, um, and I want to draw your attention to two really key areas um, in Wagner Park and Prairie Plaza. Um, right here, we have the main pedestrian entry point, the Prairie Plaza, right at the terminus of Route 9A, um, which is a major focal point, um, and is uh, you know, a point that we'll look into in more detail in the presentation. Um, and we also have uh, another major pedestrian entry point and also a vehicular drop off at the north side of Wagner Park, um, right in the Museum of Jewish Heritage Plaza. And near both these areas, we'll also be integrating uh, bicycle dismount indicators um, through the use of either some sort of detectable pavers, um, as well as potentially signage um, to discourage uh, people from riding bikes into the park. Um, but we do um, intend to allow bicycle circulation up the esplanade to the plaza itself. Um, this circulation strategy is supported by um, the uh, wayfinding strategy. Um, and you can see a couple of the sign types located in uh, the legend on the upper right. Um, there's three really main ones we're going to talk about today. Um, one is a pole mounted wayfinding sign um, that can be attached to the existing light pole on the site. Um, and one will be located uh, here in the center point of Battery Place, as well as uh, entering Aperi Plaza. The second is this B1 uh, pylon wayfinding sign. Um, that gives a really great sense of an overall uh, sense of orientation. Those are located at the main pedestrian entry points. And the third is uh, what we're calling wall signage, shown in green. I'll talk about that in just a little bit more detail in a couple of slides. Um, that's integrated into the flood risk reduction infrastructure. Um, which does span across uh, these sites and provides a great opportunity to um, create a sense of arrival into these different open spaces. So zooming into Peary Plaza, just to frame um, some of the main design drivers, um, this is the footprint of our flood risk reduction infrastructure through the plaza. Um, these are flip-up gates located at ele elevation 11. Um, and you can see in the darker blue uh, where we have columns that those seal against. 
Um, we need a minimum of eight foot offset from those gates um, to operate those in the case of a power failure um, by a winch. Overlaying that with the uh, site circulation that we have in Perry Plaza, um, the decision uh, to separate the bicycle and pedestrian circulation um, to reduce conflicts and also um, kind of increase the, the sense of um, arrival once you get into the plaza inherently pushes that plaza off of the street edge. You can see on the northern side here, um, the cycle track uh, leading up to Route 9A, um, and that pedestrian entry point, that sort of threshold that you cross, uh, is just a little bit south of that. Um, we also have our connections down uh, to the Pure uh, building, um, which reflect the, uh, the grade change uh, there, um, and those strong connections up to the pavilion, uh, as well as access from the bus stop here, um, which connects to that main pedestrian entry. Um, and we can use this sense of spatial definition to our advantage. Um, so we have these three basic zones in Perry Plaza, the lower plaza um, by the, the house, uh, the building, the upper plaza, um, which you can see here overlaid is the emergency access turnaround, um, and then that street edge uh, where we have um, the right of way connecting to our plaza. And this is an opportunity to extend that park edge um, to pull these green spaces in from Wagner Park and the battery, but also to integrate um, these site security measures. Um, so we take that, that sort of green band and we cut through it in a few areas. Um, one near the bus stop, um, introducing a new access point here from Battery Place to shorten that access route um, to the upper plaza and to Wagner Park um, in this location. Um, another coming across Route 9A, um, uh, as sort of the main entry point, and then a third continuing that pedestrian circulation um, traveling uh, to the east um, along the right of way into uh, the plaza. So we looked at a couple of different options um, that uh, we're just going to show you one um, briefly here before we show kind of our preferred alignment, or sorry, alignment, um, the preferred design option. Um, and we're looking at a balance of openness um, and uh, planting. Um, and the use of um, standalone features such as bollards, um, which we're being very careful about um, introducing too many of, um, especially on the right of way. So in this initial study, we looked at sort of what does it look like if we maximize the stairs um, and open this area up as much as possible. Um, obviously, that introduces quite a lot of uh, um, uh, bollards, uh, but also maintains a sense of openness. This is what it looks like in 3D. Um, ultimately, we chose um, and our, our preferred option moves forward with something that's a little bit more balanced in terms of planting, um, but also maintains a very generous sense of arrival from um, uh, Route 9A, um, as well as providing that access from the bus stop. So here you can see the preferred design and plan, um, continuing that green edge all the way across this northern edge of Peoria Plaza, but still maintaining um, that new access ramp, um, the wide and generous central stair um, and the continuation of um, the pedestrian movement um, east into the battery. And just overlaid with this um, is uh, kind of the myriad of things that are driving the design here, um, including some of the, um, the features that we're, we're um, adding in terms of site security. Um, so you can see here um, that uh, the battery burn, or sorry, the landscape burn along battery place um, terminating and sort of transitioning into a 40 inch knee wall um, along the northern edge of Perry Plaza, broken in key locations for pedestrian access. Um, we've integrated um, some seating um, here, and you'll see that again in a couple of groups coming up as a way to provide uh, some places to rest near the bus stops, but also to try and um, break down um, um, this wall. What that starts to look like, um, just to give you kind of an overall sense of the massing and diagram, um, is um, landscape planters that we carve away to provide these access points into the plaza. Um, and we think that it ultimately creates a, a very well-defined entry. Um, and you'll see in a view coming up, it also serves to sort of frame views out to the water and also frame the view back um, to the, the Peoria building um, in the background. Um, some of the, the key things I'll point out are the elevations. So we have our flood risk reduction infrastructure at elevation 11 at the very top here. And we slope down a little bit towards the stairs, um, get near elevation 10. And then we either have stairs here or ramps on either side. 
um, to mitigate that grade change. So when you enter this area from the Hudson River Greenway, you have the choice to either uh, continue straight to the stairs or go in either direction um, and use those ramps to get up to the top. And that'll um, take you directly up to Wagner Park or towards the battery. Um, so the view that you you'll get as you walk across here um, is, is represented here. Um, so um, the key map on the upper right here kind of shows what, what we're looking at um, crossing uh, Battery Place um, and looking at the northern edge of Peoria Plaza. Um, this is an opportunity, like I mentioned before, to reuse some of that uh, tapestry, uh, the stone that's out in Wagner Park today. Um, we'll be using a combination of existing uh, reuse of existing stone and also new tapestry to achieve some of the rounded forms you see in the blue here. Um, and that helps to really uh, bring a lot of texture and richness to these features um, and, uh, and, and mask the need um, for these to serve as also security elements. Um, another benefit of keeping these planters a little bit larger is that we can maintain enough space for replanting, which really starts to give um, a sense of spatial definition around Peoria Plaza um, while allowing views out um, since we can get larger trees in these upper areas. A couple of the points that um, we, we went over before um, are the, the pylon wayfinding signs with the map um, just in the foreground here, which um, kind of complement your sense of arrival. Um, the two ramps to the left and then to the right, giving you direct access up into Wagner Park, either from uh, the crossing point here, but also uh, from the bus stop um, or from Battery Place. Um, and then the bus stop is right here on the right. Um, you can see the sign and then the bench uh, for, for folks to wait. Um, taking a step back and looking in plan um, at another location just a little bit um, to the uh, east of here, um, we wanted to share um, an update to the Battery entrance. Um, and I'll zoom into this location right here, um, just for orientation's sake, uh, Route 9A is just off to the left of the screen here. Um, and you can see the cycle track coming in from Peoria on the left. Um, in this area, um, we have um, worked with uh, uh, New York Parks and um, the Battery Conservancy to reduce the width of this opening um, from what was previously 45 feet to 30 feet. Um, and that was um, in, in response to the desire to really kind of um, maintain as much planting in this area as possible, um, create the sense, uh, recreate the sense of a, of a garden entrance, um, but also maintain the necessary space for bike, um, pedestrian, and occasional track access uh, through this zone. Um, <clears throat> on this map, uh, you can see called out here just on the, the site wall here, the battery entrance sign. Um, and we have a small update for you today on that as well. Um, one of the uh, design comments from PDC um, was to relook at uh, um, how these signs are being treated and what they uh, are really indicating. Um, and it was their their desire to have these indicate uh, welcoming to an open space um, rather than a neighborhood. And so we've um, made some design changes in response to that. So you can see the three. Um, Kind of wall signs as we were calling them in, in elevation here. Um, and those will um, welcome you to the battery, uh, to Pier A, or to Wagner Park. Um, and uh, in addition to kind of changing the content of these, we're um, looking at uh, using an inlaid approach um, to uh, embed these letters rather than inlaid metal as we were using before. Um, so these are just some precedent images of, of sign types that we were looking at for inspiration um, uh, when we look at these, uh, these wall signs. Um, <clears throat> okay, so zooming back out, um, this is a plan of Wagner Park, and I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, Battery Place um, and some of the wayfinding considerations that we've, um, we've really focused on um, as we've uh, pushed forward the design refinements um, to support intuitive wayfinding at Wagner Park. Um, and this slide shows you um, these two really critical areas, uh, both the vehicular drop off and pedestrian entry point um, to the north um, near the Museum of Jewish Heritage um, and the pedestrian entry point um, down to the south in Pier A. Um, 
And what I'll present to you in the next few slides are um, what we've been thinking about really critically, uh, both from um, access point locations, um, from the different types of transportation that people are using to get to the site, um, the different ways that people uh, navigate the site um, and what we can do to support um, this wayfinding, um, the materiality um, of uh, battery place um, and design in this area and how that supports these wayfinding uh, decisions, and the planting palette, and, and once again, how that supports um, the overall design uh, response to this area. Um, so we reoriented, reoriented the plan here so we could zoom in a little bit, the key plan is on the upper right. Um, and some of the things that um, I'd like to point out, um, we talked about already. Um, on the left, um, you can see a label of number one. This is a new ramp that's been added for direct access to Wagner Park in this area, along with labeled in number five, um, this uh, a new bench um, for the bus stop at the south. That also happens at the north, um, where we have a bus stop as well. Um, along the along Battery Place, um, as I mentioned, we, we really are kind of creating a unified street edge um, and using a series of strategies to, um, uh, as we refine this design, um, make it as easy as possible to intuitively know where you're going. Um, and so some of these strategies include um, reducing um, the, the length of the northern Malay um, by tightening up that slope. Um, to really uh, open up this entry point here. Um, you can see where the, the northern LA landed before in a dashed line. Um, we've tightened that up um, and reduced the overall walking distance from the entry point here to uh, 140 feet, which is um, a very short distance to go. Um, that's supported by the pylon uh, wayfinding sign um, in this location as well as in the south. Um, in the center, um, we will also have that pole mounted sign um, should anyone um, accidentally be dropped off in this area that will direct them to the north or the south. Um, we do have um, are showing a little bit more accurately now kind of where the red curves will go, um, both at the bus stop um, as well as around um, the service entrance here. So that'll be in the stopping zone. Um, and we are creating uh, another sense of uniformity by showing um, adding the street trees in here um, as well. Um, <clears throat> these same elements that we wanted to walk through a series of elevations to show this whole uh, piece in context. These same things are called out here. Um, so in the background um, is the pavilion. Um, to the left um, is that entrance, that staircase into Peoria Plaza, and on the right um, would be the entrance to, to Wagner Park um, from the north. Um, and in this elevation, you can see a couple of things. One is that uh, that site wall in the, in the, in the foreground. Um, that 40 inch height wall, which tapers down to an 18 inch uh, knee wall containing that berm. Um, and that happens where the security elements shift um, to um, the back side of the berm. Um, we have the seating at the bus stops um, at the south and at the north. Um, and then most importantly, um, the large planting area in the center, um, which uh, really helps to make this area read as a continuous, um, a continuous element. We want this whole space to blend as much as possible into the landscape. And a strategy we can use to do that is to really focus on where we locate what types of plants. Um, so the arrows on the top on these two diagrams kind of show a, a basic um, planting strategy, which helps to support the wayfinding and signage strategy, um, really with the goal of focusing on intuitive wayfinding and signage where necessary. Um, so by locating Darker color, your darker color, excuse me, and small foliage in the center, um, and lighter colored and large foliage in the sides, um, as well as more color um, and more height, um, we can really create these sense of uh, invitation and sense of arrival um, where a pedestrian entry um, is going to be directed. Um, and that also helps uh, the, um, the service entrance in the center of um, this elevation to blend in with the landscape as much as possible. Um, the use of jet mist and the painted steel, which we'll show you in a couple of slides, really blends in with that darker foliage um, and creates a seamless condition in this area. Um, the other thing um, that we have uh, working for us is uh, the materials on the site. And so um, 
the color coded diagram on the top shows um, the stone, um, the tapestry stone in the foreground, um, and the jet mist in the background. Um, uh, again, accentuating that sense of depth um, and letting the service entrance and uh, um, the architecture in this location fade into the background and really become part of the landscape. Um, and then using a very light um, stainless steel guardrail um, at the top um, to keep this as open and as light as possible. Um, and, uh, and then the use of wood um, to soften um, where we have uh, these uh, stone kind of eyebrows coming up on the left and the right. Um, and I think we we have Gabe um, Gabriel Smith from Thomas Pfeiffer and Associates on the line. Um, if if Gabe is here and unmuted, I'll let. Uh, have you Hi, can you can you hear thoughts? me okay, Hogan? Hey Gabe, yeah, we can hear you. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks for having us, and thanks for hanging in so late. Um, uh, what we tried to do this is a, this is sort of an update on where we are currently with this battery entrance. Um, we've been back and forth on it a good bit, um, and we just wanted to show you where we've advanced things. Um, so the area that we're looking at in the lower elevation, as Hogan said, is right in the middle of the uh, right in the middle of the berm there. And then the upper portion of this drawing shows you an enlargement of that elevation. Um, and then on the left side of the drawing is a kind of a sectional cut. But you can see that the, the gray steel that we're we're using for the doors is absolutely push with that um, stone. Okay. Okay, but uh, if you're breaking up a little bit for me. Um, just is, is it my speaker? Sorry, is that a, any better? I think a little better. Yeah. Okay. So um, this this slide just shows a kind of material palette that we're proposing uh, to use across this elevation left to right uh, jet mist is obviously been talked about um, painted steel for the the surface of these doors that are flush with one another across the whole face and then um, painted signage where it's necessary you can sort of see that indicated on the left and right side of the screen there in these rectangles to identify the the parks entrance and the service entrance um, our structural team is working on a deployable flood protection system that would be installed across this um, in the interim before all of the alignment is complete. Um, we have some light fixtures um, and some pulls and a planter. Um, and all of those are really meant to be kind of monochrome so that we get this kind of elegant and restrained, um, but really tightly detailed um, facade. Okay, next. Thank you, Gabe. Thanks, Hogan. Um, and as Gabe mentioned, I mean, this has really been a collaborative effort, I think, to, to you know, to make this work as seamlessly together as possible. Um, and you can see that in this view. Um, so this view is taken um, if you were standing at the bus stop in the south, looking north along Battery Place. Um, and in the foreground, um, that planting scheme really creates um, kind of a beautiful focal point, um, which is repeated in the background um, near where you see the bus stopping at the northern um, side of the alleys. Um, this planting strategy combined with um, the use of stone, light stone in the foreground, dark stone in the background, and that really um, limited and, and sort of tactile use of painted steel for the service entrance door, um, as well as the use of street trees, really help um, indicate intuitively that the, uh, the main um, pedestrian entrances and really the, the action is going to be um, uh, up delays um, and in um, the main entrance to Wagner Park. Um, and it does help uh, make the, the architectural um, expression of the street grade really fade into the background. Um, and so this element um, starts to be primarily as a landscape uh, treatment um, along uh, the stretch. Um, taking one more view, um, looking south from the Museum of Jewish Heritage, um, this uh, picks up a couple of the updates that I discussed before. Um, so. The entrance to the LA, uh, you can see kind of directly in the middle of the view here, um, past these existing trees um, and the existing bench um, in the foreground. Um, it's a very wide and open experience. Um, if you remember um, 
last year, almost a year ago, we, we reviewed this with the mayor's office of, of people with disability um, and uh, who, who gave their blessing to this approach of really creating a universal access to Wagner Park, um, one access point um, that is open um, and can be used um, by anyone. Um, and we've, uh, we, we can achieve that here um, through uh, the use of, of ramps and landings up to Wagner Park. Um, the landings in this case um, serve a secondary benefit of providing access into the Northern Gardens. Um, and the use of the planting strategy along um, Battery Place, um, shortening the length of this Northern Allay, um, softening this corner, um, locating signage um, at key intersections, um, and articulating that street facade um, where appropriate near the bus stops with um, seating. Um, we think really kind of wraps this into a, a full package that uh, addresses um, concerns about the condition along Battery Place, uh, as well as reinforces um, the approach of universal access um, in the lays up to Wagner Park. Um, and there's just a few more um, updates um, for Wagner Park we wanted to share with you today um, before I promise I'll stop talking and can um, open it up for questions. Um, so kind of moving into, into Wagner Park, into the body of the park, there's uh, four elements um, that we want to touch on really briefly um, today. One is to give um, this group an update on the picnic lawns, um, which we're very um, excited to be able to share this update today. Second is to look at um, the shade the shade approach and what we can do in the event cars to make sure this area is really well shaded um, for people who will be sitting there. Um, a third is the um, the approach to the maintenance area here. Um, what can we do to ensure the functionality of this area, but also ensure that it doesn't um, encroach onto the um, the public experience, the everyday experience of entering the park. And the fourth is the inlet um, to the south here. Um, and just an update on how we're approaching um, some habitat creation uh, efforts in this zone. So zooming in really quickly, um, if you remember, this was kind of the preferred direction that we um, all discussed last time um, in terms of adding um, new lawn space um, closer to the water, closer to the esplanade, um, into the park design. Um, so the central lawn up here um, at the top elevation um, these two picnic lawns are at uh, split elevations, um, cascading down to the esplanade and the water. Um, you can see that in this uh, section here. So going from the left to the right, you have the esplanade at roughly elevation nine and a half, um, a planting buffer, which is um, a minimum of eight feet, where we have that maximum width of the picnic lawn at 20 feet. Um, that's at uh, 16 feet um, adjacent to our garden path um, and seating in the in the center here. Um, and then the top lawn at the upper elevation of 21, um, which is contiguous uh, or adjacent to the main lawn. Um, and this section shows, um, and the view shows, which I might as well switch to now, um, how these two, uh, these two lawns um, in combination with the upper lawn really also start to serve as um, uh, something that's greater than the sum of their parts in that it creates uh, more of uh, a uh, contiguous open space um, through their adjacencies um, by allowing kind of passive access through these different areas and creating seating that starts to unify the different um, lawn areas. Um, and what this view um, also can show us pretty well is how um, the lower picnic lawn here um, really does start to feel very close um, to the water and close to the esplanade. Um, and it gives you almost a little overlook um, over people who are walking along the esplanade over their heads um, and using the, the planting strategy, the trees to kind of frame that view. Um, we really have a very nice experience here um, along the water. Moving a little bit farther south um, to the event terrace, um, we have um, a couple updates to share uh, today in terms of um, how we can integrate a little bit more shade into this zone. Um, so, as you know, um, one of the kind of primary uh, design planning principles of this has always been to maintain views out um, to the water, um, views to the stage um, as well, from the roof of the pavilion, from the central lawn, um, and from um, the gathering area um, in between the building massing. And that also aligns with the goal to uh, view the Statue of Liberty kind of on this access, um, some, uh, something that um, we can do today. And we, um, it, we'll be able to recreate. 
Um, so keeping that in mind, we are able to shift the tree planting on either side of the event terrace. You can see the outline um, in the black dash line underlaid um, and uh, adjust the species in this area to give us a little bit more shade, um, uh, especially kind of the main seeding areas than we had before. Um, so the species that we're pro proposing is a skyline honey locust. It's a very um, well suited shade tree for this area. Um, it provides uh, a great amount of shade and um, can grow um, you know, quite large and give um, a nice rounded canopy um, to provide shade, uh, not only in areas that you see in the plant, but also tasked in the different zones um, in the terrace seeding and depending on the time of day. Um, and so we think this is a, a really effective way to provide shade uh, while kind of maintaining um, these key views out to the stage um, and out to um, the river and, and beyond. Um, one last thing, I, I promise. Uh, if we are uh, zooming up to the maintenance area, um, just in the north of the site. Um, and in plan here, I know there's kind of a lot going on, so I'll just take a second to orient us. The Esplanade is on the left, um, and then this is the northern um, entrance to Wagner Park um, from the Esplanade, the Grand Stair, and um, the entrance uh, along the ramp, which leads to those picnic lines. Um, what we've looked at here is how do we maximize uh, the use of planting um, and again adjust our planting and material strategy to really respond to um, some of the concerns about screening um, and about placemaking um, and locating um, the maintenance facility in this area. So overlaid in this plan is the turning radius for some of the maintenance vehicles uh, or the maintenance vehicles that are used uh, by Battery Park City uh, Park staff um, to access the maintenance zone. And we've uh, really pushed out the edges of a couple of these planters um, in the north um, and in the south um, to, uh, to maximize the amount of planting we can have around this turning movement. We've also added a new planter here, um, which helps to screen that exposed flood wall um, in the background. Um, another strategy we're, we're implementing is to um, relocate um, the use of trees in this area to draw your line of sight across that entrance and really help people focus on the entrance to the park. Um, we took this view um, specifically looking at the maintenance area itself. Um, it's a little bit of an unnatural view, but we wanted to show sort of what that starts to look like in a really um, rough uh, model. Um, and uh, some of the, the features here, the stair into the park, um, that maintenance area tucked back by the Museum of Jewish Heritage, and then the tree planting um, continuing across from these planters uh, from the gardens of the Museum of Jewish Heritage into Wagner Park. Um, and cutting that away, um, the flood wall is continuing behind us, transitioning from a glass top flood wall um, into uh, the site wall, which wraps around the back of that maintenance area. Um, the, front end, the front of the maintenance area is screened by uh, very discreet metal louvers, which um, we're uh, proposing to be very similar in treatment um, to the service entrance um, along Battery Place. Um, again, to kind of beautify and simplify the materials we're using in the park. Um, and the tree planting in the foreground, um, creating that sense of rhythm and drawing your attention to the park entrance. So what you see as you're walking along the Esplanade into the park um, really is that uh, sequence of tree planting. Um, and uh, as uh, the planting matures and, and starts to really become lush and robust, um, the maintenance area is very set back um, from that uh, Esplanade experience um, and from the entrance to Wagner Park. Um, really quick, uh, the Puree Inlet um, at the south, um, right by the Puree Building. Um, this is an area we've studied in a couple different iterations, um, and we're happy to share uh, where we've landed um, tonight, um, which is really to look at how we um, reuse the existing structures of uh, the, the relieving platform to create an overlook, um, but then use uh, a multi-level approach um, to create uh, four different kinds of um, elevation, I'm sorry, uh, habitat creation. Uh, so we have our upland planting um, at elevation nine, um, tidal planting at elevation six, um, and then we have the chance to create um, as well habitat shelves uh, in between elevations three or 4.5, which is something that can also be applied around the vertical faces of this, um, kind of even uh, potentially around the corner. Um, and then a little bit farther, um, that reef habitat um, down elevation uh, one and a half. 
Um, that starts to look something like this um, in sort of a, a massing model um, where you get uh, this play of different levels of uh, planting, um, different types of planting. Um, you're still able to maintain tree planting in this area and create um, a new connection to Peri Plaza and that sense of sort of a, a continuous esplanade in this zone, but also uh, reuse um, the piles from the looting platform um, to create a little overlook uh, to get a better vantage point and to see some of these um, new habitat areas in the map. So with that, um, happy to open it up to any questions anyone might have, and thanks all for staying through uh, that presentation. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, it, you know, it's shy of 10 o'clock. Um, it's probably almost impossible to give this its due, at least for me personally. And I think I, I'm just getting a text from Tammy who feels similarly. Is there any, I mean, I think we can entertain a few questions tonight, but given the hour, is there any possible way to have you guys come back in March for a sort of <laughs> post-mortem on this? Or I don't know if that's possible, Diana and all in the scheduling, but I, I do think this is tough to sort of try to accomplish. Um, I, I don't Sorry. know. You and know, I guess one so of my questions, that, yeah, sorry, Alice. One of my questions that goes with that is, will we lose our opportunity to opine? I mean, I have some comments to make on that stuff, but I want, you know, everybody from the committee to be able to comment. And I see hands up in the public center before as well. So. Uh, if I could answer um, the question, certainly it was important for us to, um, to, get this in front of you um, this evening because of where we are in our uh, in our design process. Um, we can come back um, and um, have further discussion. Um, and, and certainly your your ability to opine is is, is not um, diminished, but um, you know, I, I would be remiss if I, if I if I indicated that there is you know there is extensive um, capacity for us to make significant changes to to the design elements that we're showing at this point. Um, so if there's something that um, that you know you're you're certainly that you're you're particularly concerned about or um, want to make sure that we're aware of, um, I, I mean, the sooner, the better, because right. um, we, we're, we're, okay. we're pretty advanced in the, in the design process. All right. what, what it's sounding like, Gwen, if I'm reading it right, and maybe, and I'm getting a, a note here that we actually have a pretty full schedule um, next, next month. So I, I guess we'll have to stick in here for a while, but maybe just to be really clear, it sounds like this is all at 95%, which really means there's really no room for us to opine or influence any of this uh, very much. Is I would that correct? Say, I would I say, mean, honesty, uh, yeah, say uh, I would say around around the margins. Um, some, you know, uh, certainly mm -hmm. if, if, you, if we've got um, questions or concerns about, you know, materials or, um, you know, planting pallets and, and um the the screening of the of the the maintenance area certainly we can we can look at those things if it if it involves some fundamental change in design approach then that's going to be more problematic all right i just want to okay, before yeah, I, can I, Tommy, I want to just finish if i may i just want to say you know uh, i would just have one question i mean i pulled up the, uh, uh, our resolution on this park which we wrote this, I think four, three, but I think maybe four. And this was actually almost exactly a year ago to the day, February 25th. And I just want to, I'm just going through it. I actually don't see any one of, or very few of what we described as very critically important pieces to us to review addressed at all. And so I'm just sort of, frankly, a little, either I'm, it's so late, I'm ti too tired to have seen them, but for example, the entire way that we were going to look and ask that you, I mean, I could just read it. Um, you know, that we were very concerned about the way that the building was meeting the ground. Um, and we asked for more drawings and plans. We, we don't even see the building in any of these drawings. Did I miss something? I mean, I haven't even seen the entry at the ground level 
Battery Park City Authority, which is next to the kitchen entry on a major street. This right. There's no, is there a perspective of that? Do we see the building from it? I mean, this is a major building on the site. I mean, this isn't gonna be, you know, it's it's pretty it's not inconsequential. Anyway, I mean it's designed, it's done. I don't feel that personally that it ever got resolved or addressed what we had asked for on that level. Um, but such is life. So I'll just go on record saying that it doesn't seem to me, and I'll leave it at that, that many of the community board's concerns were fully addressed. And I realize that's probably very difficult. There's probably many reasons for it, but I did want to go on record saying that as much as there's been engagement in this last piece of it in the, over the year, we never re-engaged and we're seeing something that's not all that different than what we saw a year ago. And I would say many of the concerns might be the same. And I don't mean to be super critical. You do a beautiful work, I'm sure. Everybody has gone, you know, to the 10th degree to get it right. But I, just to be specific, it doesn't address the, it doesn't address the community's concerns. Let, let, if, I could, if I could just address that one point, and I know that, I know given the the late hour probably you know kind of um rushed through this a little bit um more than we otherwise would have but um i know that there was a there were um concerns and comments made about the um the, the service entrance and whether or not there could be an entrance at the battery place level if there could be a ramp there could be stairs um and um Certainly, our team looked at that extensively, both before the comments <clears throat> that um, we received from um, the committee and afterwards. And <clears throat> um, the the team can go through and, and discuss um, how they evaluated that. And um, we know that that part of that was a concern about how the building read from the street and, and whether or not there was um, possibility that um, that people, pedestrians or people getting dropped off might uh, wind up uh, dislocated and confused about how to approach the pavilion because of the appearance of the entry point at the street level. That's been really the, the, the focus um, after the determination was made that there really is not a feasible way of responsibly creating an entry point, a public entry point at that location um, from the battery place level, that has um, informed that those comments and those concerns have informed the work that has been done by the team to really focus on um, the legibility of that space and what it, how it reads, so that the, the opportunities for people to get lost, mis, uh, uh, lost, or, or, or confused about well, where they are. Uh, I mean, is I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to agree to disagree wholeheartedly on that. I mean, I couldn't feel more strongly on myself personally as an architect, but that's neither here nor there. I certainly am not questioning the likes of. You know, time five for I mean, it's a tremendous firm, but that particular point I don't agree with. I think it's a terrible mistake not to have an entry off the street. And let me just ask you if you're elderly in a wheelchair, where do you go to get into this building? Do you have to go up all the way up the ramp? You're not, there's no way to get up from the obvious drop off point in front of the building directly on center where the street curves. Is that not a you cannot enter there? You have to go. You have to take your wheelchair or walker and go all the way up the ramp. Is that what? Well, the, well, let's, 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 can we start with the with the with the point of, of where the obvious entry point? That's part of what what we've been talking about. Is is what they seem to be the obvious entry point is not necessarily the obvious entry point once the design is has been consummated. Um, so so, I mean, Hogan can go can walk back through that with you, but. We took this. We took this entire plan to the um, mayor's office of people with disabilities, and there was absolutely no concern on their part in terms of uh, of someone in a wheelchair being able to access um, the pavilion from the, the ramps on either. Well, end. I just want to. Yeah, no, I'm not sure. I'm of course they could get in. I'm just asking if if what is the trajectory? They have to go up the ramp. So if it's raining or something, they still have to go all the way up that long ramp. Is that correct? There is no way other way in. That's all I'm asking. 
Yes, they yeah, go through right. the LAs. Right, okay, yeah. okay. Um, all right, I'm gonna open it up, um, you know, uh, let, what do we have, Betty K. Okay, Betty? I just want to reiterate support what Gwen was saying. For people with disabilities, this is nothing unusual. The same thing with someone who has strollers. You're gonna be approaching from the east, from the north or the south, so they will actually get to the ramp before they bother to get to the middle. So it really won't be a problem for most people. They'll be dropped off. They talked about the signage. In the middle, it tells you you can't have access there and directs you to either side. So there's a car drop off. They're also directed to where to go for the shortest walk. So thank this is pretty you. typical. Um, thank you, Betty. Uh, sure. Anybody else from the committee? Uh, looks like that. Okay. Gerald Forsberg. Well, hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Uh, good evening. Uh, I okay. just have, I know it's late and this is the first time I'm seeing this presentation. I just have three quick questions. Um, one is, will the proposed pav pavilion permit the same rooftop views as the existing pavilion uh, to the public? Uh, there's those, those great stairs there, and I didn't see those in this uh, current building. And and the, the the views up there are absolutely amazing. Uh, second question is, will the public restrooms be continued in the new structure? Um, and third, will uh, native non-invasive and uh, non-hybrid trees be installed? I think there was mention of uh, skyline honey locust, and I don't know that that's native. Um, Hogan and, and Gabe, you want to? Yeah, I'll take the first two and Hogan can take the, the third one. And, and beautiful work, question. by the way. Thank you. Um, yes, rooftop views are available. Um, probably uh, more available in terms of overall frontage than what you have uh, now, but we could certainly figure that out. But yes, they, they're going to be incredible views from the roof. Um, the second question is about the restrooms, and yes, there are restrooms, public restrooms. In fact, it's a very important design element in the in the project, and it's taken a lot of effort to uh, to knit those in. So, Hogan, I turn it over to you. Just just before you go, this is uh, Jenny Dudgeon from Battery Park City Authority, um, and and Gerald, you mentioned this is the first time you've seen the project. Um, the pavilion itself was presented um, in January last year. So if you go to the Battery Park City Authority website, you can actually find a copy of that presentation, which has the plans and a lot of rendered views in and around the pavilion to give you a lot more context and shows you how to get to that roof. Wonderful. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, <clears throat> thank you. And yeah, to, to your last question about native planting, um, we are um, shooting for absolutely as much native planting as we can on the, on the site. Um, as part of the wedge uh, sustainability guidelines, um, we um, reach uh, roughly 85% um, on the site. Um, the skyline honey locust is, the, the honey locust that we're using here is a, is a native species as well. Is, is it a hybrid? I, I didn't see it. I, I looked on a couple of the native um, sites and I, I didn't see that listed as a, I know that the um, American honey locust is native. I believe it's a cultivar um, and we have, um, I know other members of our design team um, as well who may be able to speak in a little bit more detail to that specific point. Uh, but we selected um, this particular honey locust for a couple of different reasons. Um, one um, was it's, uh, uh, it's thornless. Um, two is that it holds on to its uh, seed pods, which are very minimal um, for as long as possible. Um, and three, that it has really beautiful fall foliage and a great form, um, which we think makes it an excellent fit for this area. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, uh, Michael Frankauer. Yes, thanks, Alice, and uh, thanks to everyone who's sticking it out with us here. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask. Uh, um, I don't know if you could go back to the view with the uh, the, the bike lane, uh, the bike connection, because um, I think uh, what you guys have is nice in that you've thought about separating, you know, pedestrian traffic for um, cyclists going north onto the uh, the greenway. But I think in a past meeting with you guys, we had asked if you guys could take a look at um, improving the bike connection for cyclists that perhaps are coming out of the battery and trying to get into Battery Park City. 
Um, and I'm curious if, um, like what a cyclist would do there. Oh, Michael, I can, I can talk to that. Sorry, go ahead. I'm cutting you off. I, I can talk very quickly to that. Um, so we do have a, uh, a bike plan for broader Battery Park City. Um, and obviously with, with what we're showing on the screen right now, if you're coming from the east from the Battery, it does take you across onto 9A, which as you know, is a pretty big bicycle arterial. Um, right. From 9A, there are connections um, at key crossroads of first place, um, uh, third place, um, West Ham Street, so they'll take you across to the Esplanade. So certainly our preference is that people use those main cycling routes to get across and into the city. We, we're not stopping people from coming through, as, as Hogan mentioned before, onto the Esplanade, but we certainly are encouraging people to use those sort of um, primary routes. Got it. Thanks. Sorry. Um... Uh, I think that's Tammy Meltzer. Tammy. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask some, thank you, Michael, for bringing up the bike lane. I do think that there is uh, a very strong issue, much to the point. It is unrealistic to think that people will not come straight down Battery Place as they currently do on the bike lane. It is a very difficult place for pedestrians at the moment because bicyclists come through the LA and they don't know where they're going. And unless you're going to put a gate, which I don't see anything or some kind of physical barrier to direct bicyclists to go up that way, it is more inviting for them to ride straight, which is the current existing plan that is there now. And that is a noted and known traffic issue if you're a pedestrian or a bicyclist. So I'm sad to not see that any kind of solution there. I didn't see wayfinding sign or security measures that really shunt bicyclists or say to dismount. So I have concerns that don't seem to be resolved with that. And then- uh, um, Oh, sorry, go on, Tammy. I was gonna say, we, we're definitely looking at the use of um, change in, in surface materials uh, and also the use of dismount signs at, at critical thresholds and junction points to encourage cyclists to dismount. Um, uh, if they are coming through those areas, which you've rightly said, you, 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 uh, you know, they, cyclists do use, uh, but certainly we are looking at discouraging that. And we're working with uh, 212, who are our wayfinding consultants who have worked on the broader Battery Park City wide wayfinding signage uh, project um, at the appropriate placement and along with, with the uh, ACOM and um, SiteWorks team and making sure that um, that's complementary in terms of how things are, are laid out within Wagner Park. Could you explain why a bike path was not possible to be added through the connection from the battery all the way through the front? If you were redoing the front of battery place, why there was no opportunity to add some kind of a bike? If you're talking about on the, on the street, that is, that's a much more, um, uh, it's a lengthy process with the Department of, of Transport. We have um, had discussions with them about that, and certainly we can continue to do that. But within the time frame of this project, um, you know, we, we had to look within um, the, the framework of what we had available. So certainly from the prior discussions about bikeways, we wanted to emphasize a connection with 9A and the wayfinding um, uh, signage package, which is being rolled out at the moment, also includes uh, signs along the route along the Esplanade to also connect people back to 9A. Um, and then as I mentioned, you know, looking to discourage cyclists from actually moving through the areas that we've just Design through Wagner Park and Kiro Plaza. So um, one of the problems with the, the cycleway through Kiro Plaza right now is it's not very clear in the way that the paving is laid out. Um, certainly extending the, um, the the herringbone paving along the edge of Battery Place, we're hoping will encourage cyclists to stay on that route. Um, unless they, unless they, you know, you can't stop people from doing what they're going to do unless they're very specifically uh, deliberately coming through somewhere else. But we, we've been making every effort to discourage that and get people to work within the framework of the cycle parts that are available. Um, but again, certainly we, we can explore further the introduction of a bikeway along 
um, battery place. That's just not something that is possible in the time frame of this project. Tammy, Tammy, this um, we we I, I, I have discussed this, and and I, I know that this was something that that um, you had raised before, and we are we are certainly um, supportive of um, of working, continuing to work with um, City DOT to introduce um, a bike. Uh, a bike lane um, along Battery Place in this um, in this um, segment, um, and um, but it, 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 that's something that um, the community is still in favor of. Um, then we are we are very supportive and willing to uh, mm -hmm. to carry that forward. So let me continue on a couple other questions. We had also spoken about um, a surface materials in terms of more green less cement and i do appreciate the extra lawn terracing that you've uh looked at around the straight to the back of wagner but it does seem like now there is an increased amount of concrete that was shown that's in the back of the jewish heritage museum it see there seems to be wide swaths based on the drawings that you showed of just flat cement portions which doesn't exist today in the same manner so i'm a little confused by the just huge amounts of cement and why that's required i'm not sure which areas are it, no, it, it, it's it's the main it's the maintenance area it's the it's the vis, visual on the maintenance area and quite honestly i, I i um have some questions about that myself um it seems to be it doesn't seem to be the scale for some reason. Yeah, that looks yeah, to keep, be, keep going. But I mean, even keep, there, keep, you can see. Yeah, I mean, there. that's. So uh, this this view here is showing hex paving in the foreground. Um, We've actually increased the amount of planting than we had the last time we came to this committee. So I think the is plan that? is the best, the best place to show that. Um, we've maximized the amount of planting around uh, this area and tucked the maintenance of the area back. Um, how does, so we how actually, does we've that, actually increased planting. How, how does that compare with the current condition, Hogan, um, at, at, that, at that particular point? Go, go forward two slides. I agree. That it one, it does that, look, one, that one. How, how does yeah. that compare with the current condition? If that's at that point right there. Currently, that, this this planter on the left is a uh, step is set back from where we are today. From, uh, sorry, from where we're looking in this view right now. Um, so it's actually wider today than than is shown here from at this point to the left of this pedestrian. I believe so. What we're not showing, which may be helping to kind of blow out the proportions of this, is the furnishings, lighting, and seating that are along the esplanade here. Um, I think in this in, in this point, Glenn, and, and to Tammy's question, we've actually made sure that we've increased the amount of planting in the zone. Hogan, if if I was standing on the esplanade, would I be standing in front of Mother Teresa's statue exactly at that point? Um, I think I'm going to need to zoom out to the, the plan to be able to look at that question. No, um, Tammy, the um, Cabrini statue is actually on the other yeah. side. It's on the north side of the museum. So it's right up near South Cove. Okay. And then we had discussed that we thought as a community that we weren't really sure why the um, maintenance area needed to be on the water side there and why it couldn't be hidden you know in something that wasn't sort of class a views and right yeah. near the and especially because if that maintenance area ends up being um i use the word fragrant but not in a positive manner that actually ruins the quiet garden seating areas that have all been requested and everything around there. So the community, one of the other things that was on the list of topics that we had asked for you to come back was specifically to move that area out of that location. 
can you have any dialogue as to other options that were considered for putting it and why they weren't relocated to those areas? Well, I think when we were exploring, you know, where this maintenance yard could be, firstly, it needed to be functional for the, um, the BPCA parks folks in terms of getting access to it and proximity to the areas with which they're working. Um, we also had to look at how did this affect um, other public areas um, that that are being designed for, for for people to enjoy. So you know, in and around, you can see just to the right hand side of this maintenance yard, you start to see the ornamental gardens, which really sort of wind in and around and connect to the museum across the north and across then the east. And likewise, on the south of the museum, as uh, in the museum there, the pavilion, we have more um, ornamental gardens. So. Placing the, the maintenance yard in those locations takes away from areas um, that were better suited for public enjoyment. Um, this particular location, if we go back to the 3D, and, and, and certainly I think that was, we, we were aware that it's really hard to explain what's going on here. But, you know, um, can you go to the shot with the, the flood wall um, open? Yeah, we can see that the flood wall is coming across the face of the museum. Um, we have a little opening where there's a there's an emergency egress from the building. So that's sort of a rear door for from the from the museum itself. Um, and then we have the wall that wraps around the south face of the museum, and then it cuts into the park. So it's now you know underneath that raised lawn. Um, and the stairs that you're seeing are are that sort of that entryway that leads you up the performance gardens um, uh, to that lawn. Is the the ramps which then start to peel off. But you know, I know it seems like it's prominent waterfront real estate at that location, um, but because of that transition, um, it actually isn't particularly usable. Um, and we already have this kind of nook that's created between the building and that access route. Um, it's also very well accessed for again the parks folks who can come in with their dump trucks quite readily. Um, and I and and I know from the last conversations, we're really focusing on this as a holding yard um, where they can come and move planting material in and around as they're servicing the yards. Um, uh, but that seems like from all of the options that were on the table in terms of frontage, um, this was the the least um, public essentially. Um, uh, but most functional. It's a, it's a, it's kind of a persistent, uh, you know, a kind of a chronic issue that that the the park requires um, some back of house space in an area that doesn't really have a back of house place, and so yeah. we're we're left to look for little um, nooks that may not otherwise um, be particularly accessible to the public or particularly usable to the public. And that's kind of where we came down on this one. We, there, there were other, we, there, there's really not another place where, where the, st the staging area for the parks uh, department is right now is over on the other side near the, uh, the PRA Inlet, which of course now is, is is not um, that area is not available for this kind of use under the the, the new design. So um, certainly we agree that if we had a, a better place, then then we would uh, we would go for it. But um, this seems, uh, all things considered, to be the most logical place for a staging area for um, parks maintenance and operations. I think one of my questions and concerns is where you're talking about is currently on the south side of the museum where there are currently picnic tables, there's ornamental gardens, and there's flat lawns that people use to sit on. And that people um, currently, you may not think that that's a very viable space. It is one of the more quiet areas behind the museum that people do utilize. So I, I'm not really sure, you know, yeah. and looking at, at the plans that you have and what you're saying, right now there are little ornamental areas that are back there. You know, there's park benches um, and that area that, you're sh that you showed me before, yes, I agree, you're missing the architecture, but there are, um, there's a flat lawn 
that people use and then there's a giant planter area and then there's benches that people sit on and bake racks. Uh, so yeah, it, does, I, I, it seems yeah. like all of that has been replaced by basically a maintenance area and a huge swath of concrete. Yeah, but wanna, Toby, just keep in mind, it, it can't be the same as what's there right now because we have we, we've put in the, the flood wall. Um, and can we actually go back just one second, Hogan, to that that image? Um, and as this is sort of showing, you know, that happens to be this little nook um, in that landscape buffer zone. If that wasn't um, being used for the holding yard, it would be a berm. Um, it would be similar to what you're seeing on the right hand side of the stairs uh, and as you see throughout the rest of the the terraced area where we have uh, essentially a slope uh, which is which is making that 10 foot grade change um, between the esplanade and the raised lawn um, so it isn't a particularly usable space um, in this instance it's not going to be a desirable space to be in even if you didn't have a holding yard there so it does actually make a lot of sense to use it as a back of house area just can I, can't can, see. Can I ask can you? you can, can I ask you a question, um, Tammy? I, because I'm I'm hearing. I just want to make sure I'm hearing everything that you're saying. Because you 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 were you're concerned about you know the 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 visual um, um, effect and impact, and that you're concerned. You're also concerned about the possibility of odors and noise. I mean, am I? Am I right? Okay. Exactly. And you're taking waterfront property and putting it to a storage area. I understand you don't have a ton of storage there now, but it doesn't say, you know, this is why I asked where else on the plan did you determine was unacceptable? Because I'm looking saying the back area could have been made with, again, smaller people friendly spaces versus using it for storage. It's waterfront property. Well, I, I guess I'm, I'm 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 a little bit confused about the kind of the waterfront property aspect of this because yes, it is property that is in the vicinity of the the waterfront, but it is not waterfront property in that it could be used for a variety of other great things. Um, yeah, I think I, I think to to. Um, sorry, sorry to jump in, Gwen, but I think to your, to your question, Tammy, um, we look, we did look at a number of other places and, and we determined um, going through many rounds of study that um, out of all of the areas in the park, this is the one that will have the least impact to all of the programs and uses that we're, we're fitting in. So and I think, there was no uh, way for you to put it under the building that was existing there. You have to take up additional separate space because the whole concept yeah, just, we were told in the very beginning was that the redesign of the building would be enough to withhold all the maintenance and facility things that were needed to support the park. And I think, um, and I think it's just important to remember Jenny's point that this area right here um, that really is the best location for this maintenance yard. It wouldn't be it wouldn't let's, be getting us any additional and, uh, seating me, areas. It wouldn't be getting let, us any additional water. Let frontage. me let me, let me clarify <laughs> something too because because I, I think that, there, that. I, I think that there is a I think that maybe there's a disconnect and I think maybe we should not be using necessarily the term maintenance area. It's a staging area, um, and um, because the, there are maintenance. Um, um, activities and functions that that occur in the lower part of the pavilion building this is this is simply an area that that's a holding area it's a staging area for for plants and some small tools as as the parks maintenance and operations folks to do their do their thing um, out on the grounds um, so I, I i think maybe there might be some um disconnect just because of what we're calling it and it's not going to be an area where there's to my understanding there's not composting going on there okay Tell I mean, me, i'm going to ask for final i'm comments. just going to move yeah, yeah I need to my final up. comment is my yeah. final comment is for pier a there's going to be a potential usage change for pier a the battery conservancy is actively lobbying as they've announced on their own meeting um to turn pier a into a staging area for the 
Liberty, uh, Statue of Liberty cruises. Um, so that will need a large uh, queuing area with, with some sort of barricades and things like that. Have you looked at how the determination of a multiple use or a change in use of Pier A would interact with what you have here and a potential security zone that they're looking to set up and how that would affect this design? Um, we are, we, there is no decision that's been made about a change of use for Pier A at this point. Of course, there will be um, a new occupant um, of Pier A um, at some point, but um, I have, uh, there's no plan um, that's in place at the moment to change the use for a staging area um, for the Statue of Liberty. I'm not saying that that is not being discussed, but, but right now there's no plan to do that. But certainly, the um, any any use of the building um, would um, would need to to be compatible with the design of the both the building and the exterior and um, you know without it would be pure speculation on my part at this at this time to to try to to determine how what kind of conflicts might exist. Um, thank you. Yeah, I think Tammy raises one heck of a point on that last one. I hope um, we get a res resolution on that. Um, uh, what, what can I say? I think we're at the end of a very long night. I know, Carrie, um, you had your hand up, um, or I thought, but maybe not. I'm sorry that anyone who has a further questions, and I'm sure there'll be many or comments, please send them to Diana Suite at the community board, and we will definitely field them. I'm sure you all, uh, um, Gwen and all, will be happy to to answer them and get back to people who might not have been able to talk tonight. Anyway. Um, Alice, for sure, I'll be there. It's Nick Spordone. Um, hi, hi Nick, them, thanks. Send, good evening. Of course, send them our way, of course, and we'll... Uh, Mm -hmm. Thanks, after last January, there was a bunch of recall of yeah. uh, meetings, Somehow. questions after the meeting at MJH, and we uh, we printed them all up and put them on the site. So send us whatever you have. We'll get them answered for you. Right. Sure. Well, somehow, I don't, we never have enough time. I, you know, thank you very much for the, the presentation and for all the work. I, I guess for me personally, just listening to so many of these over the years and the resolutions that are written and, you know, not necessarily completely... Uh, followed and, 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 you know, the back and forth of it all. I, I would say one thing that would be helpful going forward in the next sort of grouping of these that we're going to review and, and this one too, as it evolves ever, ever so slightly, I guess, is just to kind of, I think much better if you allowed the community, and I know you, you were tremendous with engagement, but allow us to see, and we often have asked for the alternatives. We wanted to see the different alternatives for an entry into the building. We wanted to see different alternatives for certain kinds of landscaping, certain kinds of hiding of this maintenance area, et cetera. And you often refer, well, we tried this, we tried that. Let us see that so that perhaps it would help us better understand how you've come up to your final conclusion. Because we're really not a part of it ever and we don't ever get to see it. And that's tricky and it's hard for us to really fully understand where you're coming from. So I, I might recommend that as we go forward. Um, I want to again thank everyone. I'm really sorry for this really long meeting, although it's not my fault. But anyway, thank you all for sticking it out for everyone. And um, good night, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.